Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Knights of Last Call. Here with our secret Sunday super system stream. Uh, yeah, we don't usually go live on Sunday, but we are here today because, um, well, quite frankly, uh, we're actually getting caught up on some things here at Knights of Last Call. Um, for those of you who are in our Patreon, you know that we have been hard at work building out a new studio, and uh, Bob and I made some significant progress uh, over the last week, uh, and this Friday, we actually got our brand new table set up. So we're really excited about that. And um, I've been meaning to get this um, kind of Le uh, Legend of the Five Rings series uh, to at least put a bow on it for now, uh, because there was one last important thing that I wanted to cover, which was to talk about uh, the part that a lot of people probably are very you know interested and excited to see, which is the uh, conflict scenes. And so uh, we had some extra time and capacity, and so here we are with this Sunday night live stream. So thank you, everyone, for uh, stopping by. I see uh, a couple of the usual suspects in the chat. Um, big shout out to Ben, to KC. We got Rag and Wolfbane, Boothby. Uh, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, hopefully, we pick up at least a couple more people, but uh, maybe you're going to catch this on the, the VOD. Uh, watch it a little bit later. Uh, you may not have expected this. So, uh, you know, if that's the case, welcome sure to like, subscribe, uh, let us know how you feel about these videos. Obviously, Pathfinder 2 videos, you know, are, are going are gonna to do the best uh, in terms of performance for this channel. Uh, but it is important for me to gauge interest, especially amongst my subscribers and doubly, triply, quadruply important amongst my patrons about this type of stream. Um, so, you know, it's very important to uh, make sure that we're, we're, we're doing what's, what's right for our Patreon. And that's really all that I, I really care about uh, at the end of the day. So, um, well, John, welcome. And uh, yeah, I agree. This is an excellent way to pass the time. Um, Ragan was just telling me about his first Northern Reaches game, saying that a uh, lizard folk water breathing being useful, uh, critting with a gunslinger sniper build were the highlights. All right, well, that's pretty awesome. Uh, nothing like that deployable ballistic cover. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh. My chat looks a little screwed up. Hold on a sec. Let me get my chat scrolling. Aha. Uh -huh. There we are. Um, so welcome aboard, everybody. Um, so if you're uh, if you're joining us from last time or uh, this is your first time here, today we are going to be talking about Legend of the Five Rings. Uh, this is a uh, role-playing game by Edge Studios, formerly, formerly Fantasy Flight, formerly AEG. And they are currently in the 5th edition, not to be confused with D&D 5th edition, but they are currently in the 5th edition of the game system, which was a significant departure from the way that the game had previously been run. And uh, in sort of a uh, homage to the standard Fantasy Flight games that you may be more familiar with, predominantly the Genesis system, uh, Legend of the Five Rings uses a series of sort of proprietary dice to not only resolve actions, but to give you indications how narrative moments might enter or be affected by your dice rolls. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about that, but in our first stream, we talked all about how Legend of the Five Rings, how a skill check works, how you uh, have five rings, which represent not ability scores like in a D20 based game, but rather your character's ability and propensity for certain attitudes or ways or methodologies about solving problems. Rather than talking about a stat of how strong you are, or how quick you are, the rings in Legend of the Five Rings represent how patient and logical you are, how cunning and how devious you are, how aggressive and how forceful you are. And these rings or you know ability scores, as you might call them, can be abused and applied to every type of action in the game, from a combat action to a social action to a scholarly action. You can use something like fire, which represents passion and inventiveness and uh, fury and all of these sort of really hot-headed emotional ideas. And you can use that from swinging a katana 
to making a, you know, imploring plea in the halls of a great um, imperial courtroom to writing a fiery poem that really expresses how your characters feel. Um, Those three very separate uh, skill type checks all can use the fire ring. There's no charisma stat. There's no strength stat. So in a sense, uh, your character's feel a little bit more well-rounded in the system. And it's something that I I actually really, really like. Yeah, John, um, you say, I see why I like Faye, and that means Fate Accelerated Edition. Okay, there you go. You you put it in the chat uh, so much because it uses the same uh, approaches uh, type aspects. And yes, 100%, I do uh, really, really like that a lot. Uh, So that is definitely a part of the core structure of that. So in the second stream we made a character we went through the game of 20 questions which is a way of asking about your character where they came from how uh, decisions that have shaped their lives and ultimately after the end of going through this 20 question process you have a completed legend of the five rings character and that brings us uh, to tonight where we are going to talk about conflict well At a broader level, we're going to briefly touch on scenes, and then specifically we are going to talk about conflict scenes and how they are resolved. Conflict scenes are where, in my opinion, Legend of the Five Rings shifts from a very sort of narrative gamist game uh, where you can easily play the game very much like Fate or to a certain extent even maybe like a little bit like a Powered by the Apocalypse game in uh, in the other modes. But when you switch into a conflict mode, the game becomes more mechanically complex. The game picks up a lot of D20 or Pathfinder 2-esque, you know, things that we've come to ex- associate with those types of games. So for example, in a conflict scene, you have things like initiative. It's round-based. In a conflict, you have things like conditions. You have your techniques, which are kind of like your powers or your feats. Uh, You know, you have a set number of actions, kind of like a move standard minor. The game becomes much more regimented, much more mechanical. Uh, There's a certain element of tactical play and skill at playing the game. So these all come to a, you know, ahead in these conflict scenes. Now, I suppose, let me, let me talk about the three scene types really quick. And by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Just use questions. I'm happy to answer any questions about the system that you may have. Um, you know, we uh, it's a Sunday night stream. I, I'm not, you know, we'll, we'll go, we might go short, we might go late. It really doesn't matter. It's just really about hanging out and, um, and sort of just hanging out with you folks who might be interested and really just getting that content out there onto the internet for people who might want to uh, look into this at a, at a later time. But so real low, real low stakes here, real low key. Um, you know, and if, uh, if you're interested in these conversations, you, uh, are new to our channel, I, I recommend that you subscribe, you watch a couple of our live streams. And if you like the conversations that we're having, uh, throughout, you know, the week, then check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash nice last call, where you can join us, join in on the conversation live. There's a lot of other cool options going on, abilities to play games and learn new systems like legend of the five rings. So definitely worth checking out if you're uh, in, into that, uh, if this interests you. Um, John says, this is actually one of my favorite aspects of the Genesis system and its derivatives. It's crunchy where it needs to be, but the rules get out of the way otherwise. Uh, question from Ben Asaro. Will you be covering fields of victory options as well? Ben, I can touch on them. I can touch on them um, for sure. Uh, but technically that is a, a supplement and not necessarily something that uh, needs to be in uh, you know, your, your experience of your, of your Legend of the Five Rings game. So let's talk about, and if this was a, you know, pre-made video, this, this would be cool options would come down. Let's talk about the three scenes uh, in Legend of the Five Rings. Uh, first off, the Game Master decides when and a scene starts and when a scene ends. A scene is essentially a period of time in which something is being resolved or discussed. The core part of the game is what I would call, again, there's three scenes. The core part of the game is what I would call a narrative scene. 
All right. This is a narrative scene. Thanks, Ben. If you're in your core rule book, you want to check out page 246. Thanks, Ben. Um, a narrative scene is what we would call in Pathfinder 2 an exploration mode. But in Legend of the Five Rings, that is where a vast majority of the game will live. In exploration mode, we are still you know, keeping track of time, your character is still, you still have to describe what your character is doing. And if you get to a point where your character is taking an action that might have consequences or might have uh, uh, potential outcomes that are uncertain, then the GM may ask you to make an action roll. And uh, you might have to go ahead and make a skill check uh, using one of your rings. A narrative mode is very, very just flowing and back and forth. Um, some of the more mechanical elements of the game can enter into the play, but for the most part in narrative mode, you're not, you're not doing anything with initiative. You're not doing anything like that. So the narrative mode is again, like Pathfinder two exploration mode. Uh, my samurai is going to go over to the tavern and is going to get a cup of sake. Okay. Well, while I'm in there, do I see any, you know, do I see any crane clan samurai? It's like, you know, it's just, a lot of questions and answers. If you're familiar with the conversational kind of concepts of Dungeon World, it's very similar. So that is where, in my opinion, the game lives and breathes. And to be fair, I think you could play the whole game from there. Because that style of game, if you use that style of game, and again, we talked in the first stream about what happens when you make a... Uh, uh, an, uh, Jason beats a hey, Jason. exploration mode. These hacks can't come up with their own system. Who has the audacity to steal an entire game system? Uh, never mind. No, 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 Jason. No, we didn't steal it. It's called narrative mode. Narrative mode. Um, uh, <laughs> not. It's like exploration mode. You know, I, I will leave the stealing wholesale stealing of game systems to people who are better equipped to do it. Uh, thank you for the tip, Jason B. Uh, Kieran KC says, "Is L five R Genesis inspired or built on it? Is L five R Genesis inspired or built upon it?" Uh, L five R is its own thing. It, it's it's got Genesis like similarities, but it has certain elements of it which they tried to do as a as a throwback to the previous four editions of the game, uh, which was called the Roll and Keep system, which they included in here, and we'll we'll, we'll definitely cover it. Uh, so it is kind of its own thing. Uh, Genesis uses a bunch of different dice. Legend of the Five Rings only uses two types of dice. Ring dice, black six-sided ring dice, and white 12-sided skill dice. Uh, you don't roll for, like, the threats, and there's no banes and boons. It's all just on one uh, on one set of dice. So narrative mode is great. You know, it's just how you, you can play it through the game. The second type, so that's one type of scene. Second type of scene is called a downtime scene. And this is where your character, you're not describing your moment to moment or minute to minute actions. This is the montage scene. And Legend of the Five Rings, a downtime scene could be anywhere from a couple of hours to a couple of days to even a couple of years. Jason B tipped $10. Oh my bad. BTW, have you seen the low supplement we're releasing? Adventures in Raku, Japan. It is a pretty unique setting. Uh, I missed that Lost Omens one, although I do think that uh, they have an official name for that. I think it's called Tian Chia, but uh, I think that's more China than uh, Japanese. But, um, uh, you know, Jason, I'll have to check that out when you guys release it. Um, certainly interested, always interested to see what uh, Paizo's take is going to be on a real world culture by just adding various monsters and then putting them into that setting as kind of a like, oh, OK, well, these are samurai, but... But these are Aboleth summer samurai, or uh, oh, but these are samurai, but these are troll samurai. See, it's fantasy. Um, anyways, we're just having fun teasing uh, with J Mr. Jason B. So in a downtime scene, again, nothing that we're not used to in a normal game. It's it's a montage scene, but the key element in Legend of the Five Rings is like during a long during a downtime scene, uh, your GM can do things like award you experience they can ask you what your character was working on like over the course of the winter uh and your character might say um yeah i uh i developed a i worked on this technique and the gm can say okay you've got that technique write it down you gain basically a feat 
Uh, downtime is not as structured as it is in, say, Blades in the Dark, which have a, has a very formalized downtime structure. You get two downtime actions after every score. You can advance clocks. You can acquire assets. You can train. Legend of the Five Rings does not have that detail in their scenes, but they do give the GM a lot of leeway to let the players uh, sort of gain and build um, their characters during a long enough downtime scene. So... We've got narrative scenes where you're going to be describing your character's actions moment from moment. You're probably going to be making, uh, you know, some number of, of dice rolls. Um, and when you do go to make a dice roll, you're going to describe your character's approach. How do you do that di uh, uh, skill? That's going to determine which ring you use. And then you're going to describe what you're actually doing, and that's going to determine what skill you use. And then you're going to take a number of black ring dice equal to the ring of the skill of the ring that you're using. So let's say we had a ranking of three in our earth skill, and we have uh, we describe that our character is going to think back to their training. They are going to think back to uh, the time that they spent studying. That is a very reasoning, logic, solid debased uh, approach. That's going to use our earth ring. So we would gather three black ring dice from Earth. And then our character in this case, maybe they're making a scholar check. So their character, we would look to see what scholarly skill our character was using. Uh, maybe it's uh, knowledge of government or knowledge of history. And we say, oh, we have one we have one rank in that skill. So we would take one of the white D12s, which is a skill die, and we would assemble our pool of three black ring dice and one white skill die. And we would roll them, and that's our that's our skill that's our skill check. Now, um, that can happen, and that will happen in that narrative mode. However, if you reach a point where um, the conflicts, <laughs> literally, where there seems to be a very defined conflict, and timing becomes important, and you want to make sure that people are doing things. Uh, without getting too much of an advantage on another person, and it's kind of that round-to-round or minute-to-minute -minute action, and there's a definite back and forth, and you want something that is going to be more sort of a zoom-in, uh, sort of a slow-motion zoom-in, we have the third type of scene, which is the conflict scene. All right? Let me swap over here. This whole place works. All right. So... This is the Legend of the Five Rings module for Foundry. I am not by any means an expert in it, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, but uh, this, uh, I've set this up to sort of help us sort of demonstrate a conflict scene in Legend of the Five Rings. Um, so first things first, let's talk about conflict scenes and the four types of conflict scenes that the game uh, covers. There are, number one, skirmishes. So a skirmish conflict is D20 or Pathfinder 2 battle. It is uh, probably going to be the, the, the player's characters, their samurai, uh, you know, maybe three or four or five of them. And then there's going to be the enemies, which are going to be, you know, somewhere between three to, you know, three to ten of them, right? It's kind of a small scale battle, a skirmish between the PC samurais and uh, some number of foes. The skirmish is very, very similar to your D20-based combat system, okay? Um, <laughs> this looks like a Pokemon gym. Uh, we'll get to this in a second, Ben. So that's our first type of conflict scene. Our second type of conflict scene is called an intrigue. Intrigue is social combat. Intrigue is when your characters and the NPCs are all trying to... Uh, Get something done on a social level. You want to influence a certain powerful provincial daimyo. You want to uh, secure funding from the imperial chancellery for your clan for the upcoming winner. You want to convince the local magistrate to lower your tax rate for this you know, upcoming season. An intrigue is you know, you're trying to get the emperor to... Uh, force another clan to sue for peace, right? An intrigue is any time your characters are trying to do something uh, socially, basically, uh, that doesn't necessarily involve steel. And the game has an initiative-based system for your characters making these checks in order to come up with a, a victory for your, uh, your intrigue. Uh, 
Obviously, it works a little different than skirmish, uh, but a lot of the same concepts apply, and we'll get to that when we talk about that briefly. The third type of conflict scene is called a duel, and as the name suggests, a duel is uh, two people fighting a sort of ritualized or... Um, separated combat so if a skirmish is just a couple of people versus a couple of people a duel is one-on-one -on -one. and the game system is designed to sort of highlight some of the the tropes of samurai drama around duels duels can be extremely deadly um, and in fact in many cases are the most deadly aspect of the legend of the five rings game uh, something uh, i was uh, uh Pleased to note, uh, actually, is recently Edge Studios, who made uh, made this uh, wonderful game right here, they actually recently just released a actual D&D 5th edition. I don't know if that has a term. Uh, like, What's that rule set called? But uh, they basically made a D&D 5e version of Legend of the Five Rings called Adventures in Rokugan, and they also included a dueling system in there, and they also made it quite deadly. It's actually pretty cool. Uh in that system so i i do tip my hat to them um because even in that system if you're in a duel in adventures in rokugan the D D five fifth edition version uh the uh you you if your character is reduced to zero hit points they die in a duel there's no death saves or dying saves if you're in a duel and you get reduced to zero hit points you're dead so i like that they they upped the deadliness of the duel and a duel could be very very deadly in legend of the five rings as well um exceptionally deadly actually and then our fourth type of conflict is called our conflict scene is called a mass battle and this is when you have armies versus armies clashing together on a grand super great you know super large scale and so again uh similar to the other scenes the other conflict scenes there's an initiative you can take certain actions your samurai all have various mechanical options and abilities within the context of the game that allow them to function within these types of scenes. Some characters are better at some types of scenes than other. Uh, if your samurai is a bushi warrior and has been trained in the lethal arts of the katana or the naganata or the nodachi, then they are going to be very good <laughs> at skirmish scenes and they might not be as good at say a social scene that doesn't mean they couldn't be by the way but what's really cool about this game is you are never ever pigeonholed into uh a uh you're never ever ever pigeonholed into a one i can only do this thing if your character is a super martial bushi they could totally take techniques and skills that allow them to function at court and there's no penalty to that there's no there's no there's no reason why you can't do that um it, it, granted, you might have extra abilities that make you particularly good at combat, but there's no reason why you can't. Uh, Rag and Wolfbane asks question: Are all duels martial duels? Uh, Rag and Wolfbane, yes. Uh, and this is actually important to the concept of Legend of the Five Rings. Um, a, a you know bushido which is the, the code of the samurai, literally means bushi, means warrior. So bushido means the way of the warrior. So in a certain sense, it is a martial culture. It is a culture that is based off of conflict and of war and a certain element of might makes right. Um, and to that end, um, duels are basically considered to be legally binding and so if two non-combatants uh, are essentially at odds or arguing to one another, um, you ba basically high-level politicians will have bodyguards called Yojimbo, who they specifically have because if they get challenged to a duel, they can have someone else fight on their behalf. And so like part of the, part of the tension of this game, right, is as a courtier, you have to you have to try to politic and you have to try to get your point across. But in this game, okay, <laughs> uh, I'm getting off topic here, but whatever. There's there's like 20 of us here, so tonight. But you know, keep asking the good questions. But what's interesting about this game is, in some ways, 
social encounters can be amongst the most dangerous and deadly because if you go into a social encounter it and you say the wrong thing or something happens it could be entirely possible that you may find yourselves ending up being challenged to a duel and as i just said duels can be very 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 deadly uh and a lot of really experienced courtiers will make sure that they have really 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 good duelists like in their back pocket stand on standby so that if anybody messes with them they have this sort of ace up their sleeve this code where they can basically say oh are you sure you, it sounds like we can't resolve this are you sure that you know basically saying if you don't agree to me i might just challenge you to a duel and let my boy here you know mess you up uh, and so there's this kind of crazy, weird politicking that occurs because you might go into a social situation and say, I'm going to say exactly what needs to be said. These people need to know the truth. But this is a society that very much values decorum and propriety and being very, very honorable and respectful. So a lot of times the actions of your traditional D20 PCs just don't fly here. Uh, and... Again, a duel is considered to be legally binding. And so if your characters fight a duel and you lose, you are considered to essentially, uh, you, you were wrong or you are guilty or whatever the case may be. Uh, and so yes, duels are martial. There's one exception to this, uh, which is that uh, the spell casters of, uh, of Legend of the Five Rings, the Shugenja, the elemental priests, they fight, they are not allowed to fight. Uh, they're just too valuable so they can never actually uh, fight in a duel. So they fight in a special special ritualized form of a duel called, I think it's called a Tariju or Tui Tariju, which is like a sort of a contest of magic to see who can gain an advantage on one another. But uh, other than that, yeah, all, all duels are martial. Yes, that is the case. All right, so, um, so let's talk about... Uh, Let's talk about a conflict scene and how it's a little different from everything else that we talked about in the game. So here is our uh, here is our samurai. Uh, this is uh, Matsusuke from our uh, last time we played. Let me go ahead and minimize this. Okay. So here's Matsusuke, and this is our samurai that we made last time. And let's start talking about a couple of things that we did not talk about last time about these rings and uh, and some of these stats that are derived from them. Okay, because these are going to be, these are always kind of important, but they're really important in conflict scenes. All right. So these are our characters' rings. The earth of three, air of one, fire of three, void of one, water of two. But we can see here that... Um, on the right side of our screen, we've got a couple of uh, a couple of uh, attributes called endurance, composure, focus, vigilance, and void points. All right, these are basically uh, kind of analogous to your uh, perception, your initiative, your hit points. All right, endurance is found by taking your earth ring and your fire ring, adding them together and multiplying by two. So our character has a three earth and a three fire. That's six. And multiplied by two is 12. Endurance is how, how much, you know, stamina and vigor and fighting spirit your character has. Your character, uh, as they battle, will lose endurance. And if your character runs out of endurance, they're in big trouble because that basically means that they are essentially too tired to fight, uh, weakened. They don't have the, you know, the uh, strength or stamina to go on. They are essentially, for all intents and purposes, defeated. So endurance is extremely important uh, for a combat that might involve martial prowess or something like that. Uh, of course, you could also lose endurance through, you know, travel and difficult uh, terrain and things like that. But that kind of stuff isn't necessarily the most common stuff in a Legend of the Five Rings game. So that's something to be, you know, to take into consideration. Um, specifically, uh, when your character loses um, uh, all of their uh, endurance, uh, so the, the way that you actually, this game has a little bit of a 
thing that's different. You you don't take damage to your endurance. You gain fatigue. So instead of saying you take four damage, we would say you gain or take for fatigue. So as your character battles, as your character takes hits, um, they are going to gain fatigue, okay? Eventually, your fatigue will exceed your endurance, and that is when your character becomes a uh, uh, compromise. Or actually, let me think about I got to remember the exact term because it matters. Your character becomes it's been a minute since I ran the game. Two, seven, eight, one. It's not compromise. I know that one. Your character becomes. There we go. It is incapacitated. That is what your character becomes. So if you basically have beaten up um, your character too too much, um, they ca basically cannot perform actions. Um, if you've ever played like, uh, if you've ever played like Street Fighter Two, uh, or Street Fighter Con or like you know those kind of Konami fighting games, it's like it's like when your character is kind of just like wavering back and forth. They've got the little stars going around their head. So when your character, they're not unconscious, uh, but they are basically unable to take actions. They are kind of at the mercy of of their foe. They're basically just on the ropes. They can be taken out in a second. Uh, ben asks, question, are all duels to the death or just first blood? So that's a great question, Ben. Um, there's actually uh, yeah, several different levels of dueling. Um, the first, uh, the duel to the death is the most severe and most extreme. That is definitely a duel that exists. Uh, there is also a duel to first blood, and there's even also a duel to first hit. So those are sort of like the the levels of you know so severity and severeness um that exist and there are like formalized and stylized rules around all of these things uh but um in many cases a duel to the death is when questions of honor or uh you know outrage or dignity whatever are being questioned uh, a duel to first blood or even to first hit might be used for more something like a tournament, you know, where, where it's like, this isn't a question of honor of who's right and wrong. You're just trying to see who's better. Uh, that's probably more likely. Um, but if there is a question of someone's honor at stake or something like that, then, you know, it might be a, a duel to, to first, uh, to, to the death. Or let's say that there is, um, you know, a, a, a battle is about to commence and two samurai want to have the honor of leading the charge against the enemy army right they might duel to first hit or duel even to first blood to determine who gets to have that honor uh, so though there are different uh, there are different levels and scales i should also note that there's also different uh, i guess you say there's different types of duels there are the highly ritualistic very 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 uh, you know tradition based ei jutsu duels where you have the two samurai there's no armor. They're just wearing their robes that you have to duel with a katana. Uh, you know, the, the, the katana has to start the duel sheathed. It's very, very formalized and ritualized. That is an Iaijutsu duel. That's like considered to be like the most prim, the most proper, the most prestigious, the most, you know, culture and heritage filled. They also have like warrior duels where it's just like, uh, you know, Hey, we're not, this isn't about ritual. This isn't about, uh, you know, something, something super hyper, hyper style, hyper stylized, hyper formal. Uh, this is just, again, you know, two men meet on a road. They want to see who's better. Uh, you know, you're going to wear your armor. You could use whatever weapons you have. That's called a warrior's duel or a, a musho, musho jutsu or something like that is what it's called. And that's called a warrior's duel. It's much less prestigious, much less uh, formalized and ritualized but it exists as well. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can duel inside the game. Um, so that is our character's endurance. And again, they are going to gain fatigue uh, through combat, mostly. Uh, and then when, they ex when their fatigue exceeds their endurance, our characters are going to become 
incapacitated. And that means that they're not unconscious. That's a different condition called unconscious. But it basically means that our characters are staggering. Um, and at that point, you're kind of at your opponent's mercy. You really can't act. Um, and they can basically, if they want to, they can cut you down more or less. Or if they have the right weapon for it, uh, knock you out. Our next attribute is called composure. And composure is the way that endurance was taken by taking earth and fire and multiplying it by two. Composure is earth and water and multiplying it by two. So composure is very important for a samurai in every conflict. Like with endurance, how we gain fatigue, with composure, we gain strife. Now, there are many ways to gain strife in the Legend of the Five Rings game. The most common way that you're going to gain strife in the Legend of the Five Rings game is from taking actions. When you roll those special dice, some of the dice are going to have a stylized um, uh, cherry blossom flower leaf on it. That represents a strife point. If you choose to keep that die because it might have a, another symbol on it that you want, your character is going to gain strife. Um, but your character can also gain strife from uh, other samurai or other NPCs' abilities. Your GM can also have you gain strife because of emotional, overwhelming moments. Your character, for example, has things like their ninjo, right? Their, their true passion and their giri. If your character is in a situation where they have to choose between their duty and their love, that might be very stressful and that might generate some strife. If your character has an anxiety, they're afraid of water, but the, uh, the mission calls for you to cross a lake in a boat, um, you're not swimming, but it's still going to be stressful for you. And the GM can go in and say, hey, you have anxiety, phobia of water, you're crossing a lake, gain two strife. Right, so strife is going to bubble up as you go through the course of the game. Um, so you said strife is like sanity. Yes, but we'll talk about that in one second. Um, Ragged Wolfbane, question. What binds the players together for adventures in this system? Does this system encourage PvP interaction, or does it always does it operate as if the players are always on the same side like other TTRPGs? Ragged Wolfbane, that's a great question. Um, it's a complicated answer. So I will give a brief answer, and if we have time later, I will answer it in full. Um, the way that Legend of the Five Rings is set up, you have these different clans, and all the clans have their own agendas. They all have their own plans. Uh, in some cases, the clans are even at war with one another. One traditional trope in Legend of the Five Rings is there is an imperial organization known as the Emerald Magistrates. Think of them as like the FBI, okay? Think about Lord, uh, Lord of the Rings like, oh, sorry, Lord of the Rings. Legend of the Five Rings like, and if, if, if each, each of the 50 states was all like, could be at war with one another and, uh, you know, they could fight one another and they're all competing for each other's resources. They're all part of the United States, but it's not like this, you know, it's more like, oh, Texas just invaded Oklahoma. Um, you know, Florida is, you know, suing North Carolina, right? That kind of thing. Uh, the Emerald Magistrates are like the FBI. You work for the federal government. And the idea is you come from the different clans and you all go to work together to be imperial, uh, you know, agents. This is kind of tier zero campaign of Legend of the Five Rings because basically you get to be whatever samurai you want and then the idea is you all are honor bound to serve the Emerald Magistrates. Uh, you still have your clan loyalty potentially, which could be a fun source of drama. I'm not saying that this style is without any sort of drama, um, but at the end of the day, it allows a lion clan and a crane clan and a dragon clan samurai. Everybody can make whatever samurai they want. You stick them together. They're all in emerald magistrates and they all get along for the most part. Now, some of that tension that I talked about really comes down to what you and your group are up, you know, in terms of um, what you're really up for in terms of inter-party conflict. It, does the game assume PVP? No. Um, you know, not, it does not. Um, that being said, 
The game also does not assume, and we'll, we'll talk about this when we talk about the intrigue scenes, right? That's that social conflict. In an intrigue scene, each character ha can have a goal. Your goals as a player can be different from the other player's goals. Uh, they could even be counter-purposed to the other player's goals. Um, and so, you know, if you think that it's appropriate for your campaign and your character, um, you know, yes, you can operate somewhat independently uh, of the other parties. There's not necessarily this, we're all in this together. Um, everybody has different loyalties and things of that nature. That's why this Emerald Magistrates is sort of the tier zero campaign. In my opinion, the campaign, the tier one campaign is you are all from the same clan. You might not all serve the same daimyo. You might not all serve the same uh, family, but you are all from the same clan. And so fundamentally, you are all in this together. You're all Ohioans. You're all New Yorkers. Um, and while you might come from different parts of the, the, the state, you are fundamentally bound together by your duty and your honor to, you know, kind of cooperate, but there might still be some dissension and disagreement. Um, so I don't think it's out of, you know, craziness or of, of, of that a character could, you know, uh, do stuff uh, that is, I don't want to say pvp -able, but yeah, you know, PvP. Um, it is not the, it is not the kumbaya, we're all in this together, put every, all, put all the, you know, friction and tensions aside because your job as a player is to make a character that integrates completely perfectly with the rest of the party. That is, I think, a common expectation in most D20 based games. And in this game, it is not. Uh, your character can have these passions and anxieties. In fact, um, if you flip, if you're if you're in your core rule book and you're in your PDF, um, if you flip to page, hold on a sec here. Maybe I don't know. Okay, um, if you flip to page two ninety eight, this shows an example of what's called the. Uh, the Wheel of Discord. Um, and this is a whole section here uh, about how to play each character's duties and desires against themselves and against one another. Like, th this, the whole point of this game is, you know, you want to create a party as both a player and a GM where one person's desire, like, I mean, the classic example would be there's this Ronin that the party is sent to hunt down and kill. So someone has the sworn duty and obligation to bring this Ronin to justice and to see them hanged or killed. Your character secretly in love with the Ronin. They love him. Uh, that that's your character's one and truly. You had a tryst years ago. Uh, you know, you know their secret identity and you're in love with them. Okay, so one person's duty is to kill this Ronin. Your ninjo is, I want to be with this Ronin, and they're my one true love. Like, the game has, like, steps to set that up. Like, it, it wants conflict to be very, you know, yeah, uh, you know, in each other's faces. Uh, so very much like that. Uh, John says, the clans are presumably like the houses in the Song of Ice and Fire RPG. John, almost exactly. There are seven main houses. There are seven main clans. Um there's a crab clan, which is very stern and very rough, and they're not very courteous, and they're not very, you know, they're a little rough around the edges, and they uh, they guard a big wall that holds back the evils of the Shadowlands. Hmm, gee, what does that sound like, right? <laughs> like, I mean, it's there's a lot of parallels, I think, between Game of Thrones and uh, Legend of the Five Rings in the in sort of the clan and and kingdom structure. Um. I do. I mean the Crab Clan exactly. So the Crab Clan is kind of like the Starks, you know. Like they're they're, you know, there's a lot of analogs there. Um, yeah, exactly. In fact, in fact, uh, well, we can we. It's very detail oriented, but you can, the crab and the cl the crane are about as completely opposite as you could possibly be. Um, they might undermine personal goals, but won't sacrifice a larger objective. At least not in a way that throws the whole thing into chaos. You know, Rag and Wolfbane part of the appeal of this game is is sometimes there's no way to win 
Now, I get it. That's not for everybody. And I'm not saying you have to play this game. In fact, I've been on the Legend of the Five Rings Discord, and I've read, uh, you know, play reports of other people's games of Legend of the Five Rings. And I go, that sounds boring. It sounds like you're just trying to play Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition using this Legend of the Five Rings system. In fact, now that there is a D&D 5th edition version of Legend of the Five Rings called Adventures in Rokugan, I imagine a lot of those players are going to go play that. And rightfully so. That should be what they are playing. Um, but, you know, sometimes in this game, you know, there's a saying from Wheel of Time, right? Uh, duty, or, duty is heavier than a mountain. Death is light as a feather. Um, you know, part of the reason why things like ritualistic suicide and seppuku is an element of this game and a part of this culture uh, is because sometimes a samurai will find themselves in a no-win situation and there is no way for them to win. Now, part of the drama of it is maybe your character does make that unthinkable decision, uh, but the game kind of is set up to put you into, into a pinch and put you into a bind. Um, long live Malkir. Ben, so maybe not a cl about clashing, uh, but a, a yin-yang tension and release. Uh, yeah, Ben, I mean, ultimately, what it's going to really come down to is your character... Um, is going to try to make the decisions and live the life that they are they they have as a samurai as default assumption is that your character is a samurai your character is going to be sort of obsessed with these values over here uh on the right of or the left of your character sheet your honor your glory and your status your character might take actions that influence those things negatively um if your character um, disobeys their Lord so that they can do what they think is right. That's great. I mean, that's amazing. In fact, you might even do that because it's going to save an entire village of a thousand people. But your character will lose like almost all of their honor um, and quite probably a lot of their glory and potentially even their status because they have done what this was unthinkable to the samurai, which is, They've disobeyed their Lord. It's like the most unthinkable thing ever. Um, in fact, a samurai might, you know, because they might do what they think needs to be done and then they commit seppuku because they basically want to preserve and say, you know, I did this and I did this for honor and, uh, you know, and, and I understand that uh, my actions have consequences and, you know, uh, I'm going to try again. So anyways, uh, these questions of honor and status and glory, uh, and to a certain extent, uh, your character's uh, spiritual path towards enlightenment, obs obs consume a samurai's existence. Uh, and they are asked to do the impossible, which is to be a human being with all the flaws and faults and emotions that human beings have, and then to literally be held to a standard that was taken from heaven and created by gods, which is Bushido. So incredibly, it's a, it's a, it, it is in a sense uh, an impossible task. So um, anyways, uh, so we get to composure and I was talking about composure as being one of your attributes. And we talked before about that your character can gain strife through their actions and through their, uh, you know, you know, the... Uh, the stuff about, uh, you know, something phobia related. But strife for samurai is good feelings too. You see, a samurai has this concept of called no, which means face. A samurai is supposed to be without emotion. A samurai is supposed to be stoic. A samurai is supposed to be in control. A samurai, in a way, is kind of supposed to be like a Vulcan. Strife can be terror and fear but strife can also be love and happiness and excitement right a, a samurai is not supposed to let these things get in the way um you know a character strife for a samurai can be basically an emotional reaction uh, a character gaining strife might be gaining strife because they're excited because they're happy because they're enjoying themselves. So as strife goes up, your character is becoming, they're losing their composure. It could be 
again, it could be that they're becoming afraid or desperate or or um, pitiful, but it could also be that they're becoming uh, jubilant and they're becoming expressive and they're becoming overwhelmed with what's going on. Basically, they're allowing themselves to feel emotions. So this is so Kurosawa. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've listened to podcasts from the creators of the game and they said, as much as this game is an attempt to simulate or emulate certain elements of Japanese culture and other East Asian cultures in a fantasy context, it's less of a simulation or emulation from of real Japanese history and more of a simulation or emulation of Japanese cinema and, and novels and drama where these things were sort of heightened to 11. So yeah, I mean, Kurosawa is a massive, you know, uh, part of this. Um, so when your composure, uh, I'm sorry, when your strife gets above your character's composure value, your character gains a new condition, kind of like how when your fatigue exceeded your endurance, your character became incapacitated. When your strife exceeds your composure, your character becomes compromised. All right. And uh, you can find that on page. Uh, hmm. Oh, I thought 371, but it's 271. You can find that on like 272. Um, your character is emotionally distraught or distracted. Um, and that's what happens when your character's camp compromised. And when your character becomes compromised, it has a mechanic. Now, obviously, from a role-playing perspective, it means your character has now exceeded their value for their composure to keep their emotions in check. If your character has the condition compromised, in my mind... It means two things. One, role-playing. Your character is now showing some signs of emotion. Your character, composure has been compromised, right? Uh, to do it, do it. Your character, as a, as a role-playing aspect, might start to, uh, you know, let a smile slip through or a glint in their eye or a tremble of fear, right? Their characters are becoming more and more... Um, uh, you know, unable to control their emotions. And as such, they aren't able to function as much. And so mechanically, so that's the first thing. Secondly, mechanically, your character can no longer, when they make a check using their dice, if a die has one of the strife symbols on it, they're not allowed to keep that die. Even if that die has a success symbol or an explosive success symbol, they're not allowed to keep that die. They can't use that die. In fact, if you make a, an action check and all of the dice have strife symbols on them, you don't get to keep any dice. Your character just fails because they're they're too excited. They're too uh, uh, they're too emotionally overwhelmed, and that means that they are compromised. So being in a compromised state, not a good thing. Now, that can happen in combat, but it can also happen during a duel. It can also happen during a uh, intrigue, right, where your character is in this tense political battle and they are just getting so frustrated. They're being insulted left and right, but the person doing it is using double speak and entendres and they are being very polite about it and you just want to rip this person's head off but that would be so impolite. They are a higher level samurai than you. They are a higher tier samurai than you. Your job is to be polite and respectful and kind, but they are just racking up strife against your character. They are just making your character want to flip their lid and flip out, which is exactly what they want you to do. Um, they are getting you emotionally compromised. And in the world of Legend of the Five Rings, you know, if a character you know, loses their shit, basically. Everyone's going to be like, oh my God, that's so horrible. Oh my God, that's so, in the, well, look at the impropriety. This was totally uncalled for and completely, completely, you know, un, uh, un, uh, un, uh, unneeded. Um, and your character will probably suffer consequences for that. So sometimes in an intrigue, one of the best ways to win is to kind of kill your opponent socially. And you do that by making them become compromised. Um, 
Yeah, so William Brand is saying big glory and honor hit. If your character loses their shit and starts breaking things in the middle of the Imperial Court, I promise you, your character is going to lose a lot of glory, which is sort of your character's reputation, uh, as well as personal honor, because you know that you did what you weren't supposed to do, uh, which is act like a petulant child. <laughs> but that's just because you're only human and you can't help yourself. Um, all right, our last two, uh, well, there's last three derived attributes are focus, vigilance, and void points. Focus is your air plus your fire. Focus is basically like your character's um, default initiative value if your character is aware. Um, it's like if your character is prepared for an encounter, if your character is prepared for a fight, then you get to use your focus value. If your character is not prepared, if your character is, this, this is kind of like your passive perception is your vigilance, which is your air plus your water, but you divide it by two. So basically, if your character is, most of the time, your character is going to have a higher focus than their vigilance. If your character is ready and they are prepared to engage, then you get a higher value. If they're, uh, you know, more, more passive perception, you get this vigilance. There are also certain techniques in the game that use your character's focus or vigilance as the DC or the TN, as it's called in Legend of the Five Rings, test number. That is what you have to score in order to get a success against that character. So a character with a really, really high vigilance score uh, is going to be harder to, say, sneak up on than a character who doesn't have as high of a vigilance score, right? So there's that. Um, and lastly is your void points. So whereas endurance and composure and focus and vigilance were all made from different combinations of these four rings, your void points is just your void. <laughs> so whatever your void score is uh, in your ring is your maximum number of void points. And void points are like hero points. They allow you to uh, spend a void point before an action and you get to add extra dice um, to your pool to basically, you know, kind of dig deep. In this case, like dig empty, right? And just empty your mind, no mind, flame in the void. Um, just, you know, let emotion uh, leave yourself, transcend a little bit, gain a little bit of spiritual enlightenment or clarity. And you can use your void points in order to, uh, you know, take a more powerful action. So void derives your void points. And so these are going to become, these are more useful and kind of a bigger deal during our combats, uh, during our conflict scenes because of how they come up all right so that was uh was a long-winded way of saying attributes so hopefully you're all with me um so let's talk about let's talk about our scenes so in a conflict scene and again i'm gonna be speaking mostly here high level but in a conflict scene we are gonna roll initiative um it, depending on what type of conflict it is, intrigue, a duel, a skirmish, a mass battle, uses a different skill for that initiative order. So, for example, in a duel, your character is going to use their meditation rank for their initiative. Whereas in a skirmish, a straight-up fight, they're going to use your, you're going to use your fitness uh, whereas in a mass battle your character is going to use their tactics score for initiative so long story short your character is going to uh, make an initiative roll higher roll means you get to go first and then you know that initiative order is set and we cycle through round after round the main difference with a uh, the main difference in a conflict scene is when we were in a narrative scene our characters could use whichever ring they wanted to use in order to make a check so if i was back in narrative mode here okay and i was like you know again there's no initiative order there's nothing like that i could say hey um i wanna you know i want to uh you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my time. I'm going to focus. I'm going to breathe. Uh, I'm going to remember my techniques. I want to use my earth ring for uh, this um, fitness check. 
and I'm going to try to withstand it, right? I'm going to brace and I'm going to try to hold this door by withstanding the force of the, of the water that's trying to flood into this chamber. And it's like, okay, yep, use your earth. So you got three ring dice and you've got two fitness dice. Great, awesome. Make your check, make your roll. In a conflict scene, whether it's a combat or a, a social encounter or a duel, your character has to pick what's called a stance. Each round, you can you can enter into a stance. And once you're in that stance, you are in that stance for the entire combat round until your turn comes up again. When you are in that stance, you can only take actions with that ring. So if I am in the earth ring and every skill I use is going, or I should say, if I'm in the earth ring stance, every skill I use for that turn is going to be using my earth ring. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Um, however, in a conflict, now note, you cannot, you're not, you could not be in a stance if you're not in a conflict. Um, when you're not in a conflict, that means you're in a narrative scene or you're in a downtime scene. You can just use whatever ring you want. You make your die roll. In a conflict, it's, you get, you're limited, but what stance you're in gives you a benefit for that entire round. So for example, if our character is in the air stance, the target number or the DC to target our character with an attack or a scheme action increases by plus one. Remember, these don't mean dexterity. Air means that your character is being elusive, deceitful, deceptive. They're hard to pin down. That applies just as much in a combat as it does in a social encounter. An air, now yes, in, in a combat, you could describe your air stance as being like your character's you know, they're not, they're staying light on their feet. They're staying on the balls of their feet. They're not really committing to any sort of, uh, you know, action. They're not getting stuck in. They're constantly retreating and falling back. They're staying really, really, you know, light on their feet and fluidic. Okay, air stance, it's hard to hit your character plus one to attack them. But that same mentality could apply to a social scene in a intrigue conflict. Your character is giving, they're not, they're not, they're not saying yes, but they're not saying no. Uh, your character is kind of only saying things that are, uh, you're very hard to pin down. You're not really saying anything at all. You're kind of talking a lot, but saying very little. And so nobody can really figure out a way to pin you on anything and, and figure out what it exactly your angle is at this, say, uh, you know, imperial proceeding. So the TNs to target you with a scheme action go up by one. So these concepts of stances apply across all four of the conflict types, skirmishes, intrigues, duels, and mass battles. So all of the five stances give you some sort of benefit, but they will also determine that you have to use that ring for the upcoming combat round. Now at the start of your next combat round, you may change your ring because you want a different, uh, you might want a different benefit from being in that stance. Uh, for example, the water stance, right? Water is all about staying adaptable, staying fluid, changing, adapting to all of the circumstances around you, uh, being mobile. A character in the water stance basically gets to take a bonus action, essentially. You can't take the same type of action twice, but if you're in the water stance, you get a, you get a bonus action. You can take two actions a turn. Um, they just can't be the same type. So water lets your character be very, very, uh, you know, all over the place. And can you can do a lot more in the water stance. But it, you know, you have to use your water ring die for all of your uh, your checks. Um, so, uh, Ryan, we can answer this question. It doesn't have to be answered now, but how would you determine a scene deserves to be an intrigue as opposed to a narrative? Can you flow in and out of them, or are there hard criteria to define each? So, Ryan Wolfie, one of the things that I want to talk about here is um, when you play a conflict scene, a Legend of the Five Rings, um, you gr your, your group has to make a determination about whether or not this is something that you really want to do. <laughs> Right, because like a combat in Pathfinder 2, uh, you know, it's round based. Each PC gets an action per turn. You know, you're rolling dice. 
it can slow the game down. When you're playing in the narrative mode, the game can feel like it is moving at a lightning fast pace. and It can be very, very appealing. When you get to a round by round combat, some people might say, wow, this, suddenly this combat or this social scene is taking 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour. As the GM, you have every right. In fact, the, the, the game even talks about this. Um, let's say that your samurai, maybe it's not the most honorable thing in the world, but your samurai is trying to infiltrate um, an enemy camp to count, you know, your, your, da your daimyo gave you instructions. I want you to scout the enemy camp. And your character has their yumi, right, their bow. And you see that there's a guardsman, you know, kind of, uh, you know, at his post, it doesn't look to be, but he, you know, he's a guardsman in the way you need to get past him. You're not in a conflict mode. You're in narrative mode. You say, can I pull out my Yumi and shoot this guy? And the, the GM says, yeah. Uh, T his, his vigilance is two. So the, t the test number, the DC is two make a, uh, martial arts, uh, ranged check. And you go, okay, I'm going to use my air ring because I'm trying to be really quiet and stealthy and I don't want anybody to hear this. And I go, okay, cool, roll the die. You roll the die, I go, you got two successes? Yeah, I got two successes. He's dead, you kill him, it's fine. In the narrative mode, things could, you, could just, you can just kill somebody. Same thing is true for convincing somebody. Uh, we go to the chancellor. Uh, I wanna tell him, you need to get us an audience with the, the provincial daimyo today. And I say, okay, oh, how are you doing this? You're like, I'm going to be very demanding. This guy's below me in station. I'm going to intimidate the hell out of him. I'm going to command him. And I'm going to use my fire ring because I am getting just in his face. I'm not, I'm borderline screaming at this guy. And I go, okay, you make your fire check. You make the, the command check. Boom, succeed. I go, he's totally convinced. He says, yes, yes, Samurai Sama. I will do whatever it is that you ask. Please, please, uh, calm yourselves down and enjoy our hospitality while I make sure that, you know, the, the, the Lord will see you today. And you go, cool, you did it. Uh, you could just totally, totally skip through it. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I got ahead to work. Can't wait to watch the VOD. Also hype because I got my L5R beginner game in the mail today. Thanks, Unfortunate Pumpkin. Thank you very much, buddy. Appreciate the super chat and thank you for the uh, uh, thank you for the vote of confidence. Uh, hopefully you enjoy the beginner game. I thought it was great. I thought it was a great intro to the game. I thought they did a bang up job with it. Um, it's it's a great it's a great introductory series. I, I enjoyed it a lot. And I actually kind of I kind of Vin Plague Stoned it where I like I think it was supposed to be like a two session and we like got four sessions out of it. It was pretty cool. Um Ben obviously being a, a shit stir here with this. Uh, thanks, Unfortunate Pumpkin. So as a GM, you can decide how much conflict scenes you want to use. I think you are well within your right to rule that anything that is combative, anything that is social, even a duel, you could resolve with a single check. And I think the game would work pretty well. Honestly, you would lose some of the crunchy tactical elements of the game. There are a lot of techniques and there that are like basically like they're like feats in the game that you can take. You could buy them with your experience and they give you a certain benefit and a certain thing. You'd be kind of glossing over that. But I really do think you could play this game pretty well without going into the conflict mode that often. And I think that's a good thing. Because conflict, not only does it take a lot of time, but I think conflict, you really want it to be something where the stakes are really high. Going into conflict means that your character's life is on the line, right? It, they're, they're like, absolute. They're, and by the way, when I say their life, I could mean their physical life, but I could also mean like their societal life. Because a character going into a conflict and comes out as a loser, like in a certain sense, losing is not allowed in samurai society, right? So uh, I think if your group really enjoys the conflict rule and you really enjoy that sort of more round by round tactical combat or tactical social combat, yeah, you could go into combat mode all the time and you could end up spending several hours every session playing out conflicts. That's fine. I also think that if your group wants to avoid conflicts, and only save them for extremely important, critical moments, 
that's fine too. In fact, Legend of the Five Rings, in my opinion, does something really well that I have always struggled with in certain D20 games, right? There are encounters or combats that I want to just say, I don't make a check. Okay, they're dead, right? Like, I just want it to just be over and done with. And then there are also fights that I want to actually bust out the minis and bust out the grid and do this really complicated big thing because it's this big set piece, awesome encounter. Legend of the Five Rings gives you the tools to do that because again, like I said, um, in the example in the book, uh, the character essentially makes a martial arts ranged attack and kills a, a guardsman with their bow um, and they're not in conflict mode and we're ignoring the composure and we're ignoring the fatigue and the day. Nope. It's just a skill check outside of combat. And that's fine because it's a, it's a minor thing. We don't need to go into conflict mode for this. On the other hand, right. Um, you know, if the, if the lion clans reinforcements are, well, we are the lion clan in this example. If the crane clans, you know, die doji, uh, Iron Warrior elite squad of samurai come breaking in just as you are about to try to rescue your lord, and you know your lord is is weakened and and clinging, you know, barely able to stand. And five Dai Doji Iron Warrior guardsmen come breaking in, and your band of samurai all you know unsheath your swords and your you know your weapons. That might be a really cool conflict, and you might want to play that out rather than just say eh, make a check. So, yeah, I think um, I think it's cool. Uh, I think having that flexibility is really great. And I think you can do that for social situations. You can do that for mass combat situations. Yeah, you could do that for duels. You could do that for even a skirmish. And I think you, I think the game system would probably work. Okay, <laughs> actually. So, um, yeah. So, uh, we get into a conflict. We've got these stances, uh, they give you a benefit and they give you a, uh, um, uh, another, uh, they tell you what you can do and, and how you can do that. So what does, uh, basically, what does a basic conflict look like? So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, we'll kind of, I don't want to say end with this, but so here is our, uh, here's our illustrious samurai. Hello. There we go. Matsu, Matsu Okago. I thought we changed his name. I thought it was Matsusuke. Yeah, I did change his name. Matsusuke. All right, here is Matsu Sake. Um, yeah, Ragon, I agree. Feels feels like better to have them and not need them than to need them and not have them. Yeah, and again, I think it also depends a lot on what your group, you know, how how much they want to interact with the the rules of that game. So here is, a, and again, this is a very very high level uh, explanation of this. But here we have our Matsu Sake, uh, and here we have a desperate bandit. Okay. So here is our desperate bandit. A um, couple of things. Number one, uh, this game has uh, the minion type for certain types of uh, NPCs. Um, you can also have an adversary. Okay. Um, and um, they work a little different. Um, adversaries... Uh, have to basically be, uh, you know, cut down and they use kind of the same rules that PCs do. Whereas uh, a minion, basically if a minion takes enough damage, they're just killed, right? They're dispatched or otherwise uh, killed and, and taken off the bat, uh, the board. So they're a lot easier to use. Uh, they're a lot easier for the samurai to deal with. Um, it's a lot, um, you know, quicker to deal with. While we're here talking about it, um, you'll see here in the upper left-hand corner, uh, or sorry, upper right-hand corner, uh, there's this little uh, war symbol. Uh, it's, I can't remember what they call it, what the Japanese term for it is. It's basically like a head piece, but it's like a war war icon. Anyways, this is the character's basically the combat CR, and this is the character's uh, intrigue CR. Uh, and it works basically the fact that, like, if you have four level one samurai they could probably take out or uh, equivalent you know if you wanted something kind of balanced um you would put four worth of combat on them but the game understands that like there are certain types of 
uh, of people, like for example, this trained Ashigaru is a combat rank of two, but their intrigue rank is only one. The trained Ashigaru is not the same kind of challenge in a social combat as they would be in a more martial or melee combat. Uh, this character here, Kakita Hatsu, and if you remember from our 20 questions, this was our character's sworn enemy who they want to duel and fight and kill for uh, ira and to reclaim their uh, uh, father's sword who he dishonored and killed. Uh, this character has a combat rating of four and an intrigue rating of only two. So again, this character is much more uh, martial focused. And so you can have NPCs that have higher social rankings and higher combat rankings and uh, you can use that to sort of identify and judge the relative difficulty. Not that I think you would be too worried about balance. I think you would go with sort of what the flow is, but I like that they provide that. And, it, and they'll even say, this is not scientific. The math is not tight here, but it is, it's more of a guideline. I would say it's more like D and D five fifth edition CR rankings than it is like Pathfinder second edition. Um, I chuckle every time he says, Kakita. Why do you why do you chuckle when I say Kakita? Um So, in any case, um Where was I going with this? I got distracted by Rivo Green. Um oh, it means little poop in Spanish. Uh well, lo siento. Uh <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, so we've got here our uh, Desperate Bandit, and uh, they have uh, eight points of endurance, uh, and they have eight points of composure, and they are wearing, uh, let's take a look what they're wearing here. They've got a Yari spear, and they're wearing traveling clothes, okay? Uh, and we can see here that the traveling clothes, uh, again, this is the foundry module, so, you know, Bear in mind that it's, you know, it is what it is. That uh, the traveling clothes provide two points of armor, which means that if this person takes damage from physical source, they will take two less points of damage. Uh, so here is our character, Matsusuke. And let's say that this uh, desperate bandit uh, is uh, menacing a uh, local town and Matsusuke uh, is in the middle of a fight could be a duel but we'll just say it's a skirmish uh, and Matsusuke wants to attack and engage with this desperate bandit now this brings up this whole thing here this what this why this looks like this Legend of the Five Rings uses as default as its default option an abstract system of combat that calls for something called range bands and the idea is that you can see over here, I'll zoom in on it. So these are the range bands in Legend of the Five Rings. And you can see that they're kind of geometric or exponential. In other words, the distance between range zero and range one, which is one to two feet to one to two yards, is only a couple of feet. But the distance between range three and range four, it could be 50 to 60 yards. And the way the game works is it is a move action to go from one range band to another. So this means that when your character is far away from the combat, they are able to move faster than when they are in the thick of it. Now, if you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, I think it does uh, because if your character is at the far edge of the vault, you know, they're very far away from the combat, they could basically be running full sprint. They're not worried about attacks of opportunity they're not worried about being hacked down or cut down so yeah in in a single round your character can move maybe a couple you know a couple hundred feet however when your character is closer to people with deadly weapons and spears and swords you are not going to be moving that quickly because it's going to be you you know shuffling your feet you're going to be taking a couple of careful steps because one wrong move and your character would be cut down this isn't like Pathfinder 2, where your character could be in the middle of a combat surrounded by dozens of deadly enemies and still somehow move full speed and not have any penalties. This game almost assumes, basically, that once you're into melee combat, 
you know, in Pathfinder two terms, the only thing you're allowed to do is step, <laughs> right? Like you can, you can't, you can't stride anymore. Uh, it, it's, it would be suicide. It would be stupid. It would be dangerous. It would be deadly. Um, and so you can move rather quickly uh, to close a range band. Uh, but then once you get closer, you know, from a, from a simulationist standpoint, you're actually moving much, much slower. Um, and so tradition, the way that, the way that this is designed to be used is you would say anyone who is inside this column with you is at range one to you. So this is, these are all the people that you could fight with, you know, your katana say, which has a range of one. I could fight all the people inside this. These characters are all range one to me. Whereas this trained Ashigaru, who is in the, the column next to me, that character is two range away from me and so my character matsusuke with a katana which is range one could not attack this ashigaru who is range two from him however this ashigaru if we take a look at this character's inventory they have a yari which is a spear and we can see here down on the left side the range of the yari is two so this ashigaru spearman can stab my samurai from this column and my samurai cannot stab them back so that's not that different than than reach weapons like we have in uh pathfinder 2 what is different is that these things also have minimum minimum range okay the range on a yari a spear is only two that means that if our samurai closes to within range one of this ashigaru spearman that ashigaru spearman cannot use his spear i have closed I am too close. This Ashigaru Spearman would have to try to fall back and stab my samurai. They could not engage at this distance. Um, they even have a range closer than one, which is zero, which I don't know how you would really represent that using foundry, but that basically means grappling range, right? You're, you're hand to hand. A katana cannot be used at that close of a range. You can't get a sword strike in on an opponent who is literally up into your grill. Um, and so there are some weapons like a dagger, which can be used at range zero uh, or range one. They can actually be used at both because uh, you can work with a dagger inside that close range. Um, so if a character comes up and, and starts trying to get work you real close with a dagger, you might have a hard time if you have a big long sword or a spear because you won't be able to get your weapon effectively to bear against them. Um, and so this is part of the reason why samurai often have a variety of weapons uh you know katanas are cool and we're led to believe that they're really awesome but they're not actually that good of a battlefield weapon in reality um things like pole arms or great weapons or things with reach and bows are way better at battlefield combats uh than a sword right because uh you know range and, and reach is important um and you know a character with a spear kind of has a pretty significant advantage against a character who is stuck using a sword. Uh, and the game reflects that for sure. Now, it's still a fantasy, you know, it's, it's still a fantasy game. So your samurai, you know, when, once they've gained enough experience, then, I mean, they're going to be really cool and they could cut down eight spearmen without, you know, blinking um, because it's it's still a fantasy game, but with fantastic elements. But there is a, a pretty, pretty, a solid element there to that range component. Um, so, uh, yes, exactly. There is a reason why spears have been one of the primary weapons of warfare for like ever. And that is a hundred percent true. And in fact, I'm uh, like, I can even go into other elements uh, of this game. It, the game goes far deeper than you probably ever possibly uh, could imagine. Um, ben, a really good swordsman is going to be able to get past a spear, but a good spearman will always win. You know, I think I saw a YouTube video where they were trying to like demo that out and they had like people with spears and people with swords and like the spearman like almost always won unless the spearman was like a total noob and the swordsman was really good. But if like the spearman was really good, like no one could ever basically close without, without getting hit. Um, there, again, the game understands that the katana Listen, the katana is a fine weapon, but it really is more ceremonial. And in fact, if we look at the katana's weapon profile here on our my character sheet here, 
uh, which is down here, here, katana, we see that the katana has two tags, ceremonial and razor, razor edged. Uh, the katana, literally, if you go to page 240 in your rule book, they have the item qualities on the page there on page 240 of your rule book. Uh, and you can see that the ceremonial uh, equipment literally um, it, it can it can mechanically change the, the target numbers of of trying to convince people that you're like a samurai or that you're a noble because possessing a ceremonial weapon, uh, you know, is important. Um, and in fact, if at the end of any scene in which you use a ceremonial item of a character with higher status than you without their permission, you have to lose three honor. So like if you pick up a higher level samurai's sword and use it, you have to sacrifice without their permission. You have to sacrifice three honor because this is not just a weapon. It's a ceremonial weapon. Katanas are a, a, a samurai soul. And, and, and in fact, the dai sho, which means little big, which is the katana and the wakasashi are essentially what distinguishes you as being samurai, that you are allowed to carry these weapons. Um, but this is getting back into the details of it. The katana also possesses the razor edged quality and razor edge is really, really cool. Uh, it lets you deal wicked critical hits, but razor edge has a downside. If you attack someone with a razor edge weapon, and you don't actually deal any damage because their armor absorbs it all, your weapon becomes damaged, right? Katanas, real sharp, real dangerous, but, you know, it's a bladed weapon. And if you're just going and hacking into thick plates of lacquered steel, your weapon is going to become a very, very, very ineffective blunt club really, really quickly because the a katana with its delicate thin razor edge might be great for cutting through people's flesh, but it is not good at hacking through people's armor. Um, and so in this way, the katana is very, very good at being a dueling weapon when you, especially a formal duel where people are just wearing light robes and you're trying to potentially kill them in one blow but it's really bad as a battlefield weapon where you're going to be fighting for a long time against people in heavy armor and your katana probably is just going to end up getting dinged and crunched and broken because it's a razor edged weapon. It's not meant to cleave and hack through armor. That's what battlefield weapons are for. That's what pole arms are for or great hammers or um, uh, nod nodachi, which is a great sword. Um, those are battlefield weapons and samurai know that and they have things like range and other advantages to sort of cancel that out. Okay. So yeah, it, um, it can be pretty, it can be pretty crunchy. So, so as Ben was saying, this is surprisingly crunchy. Yeah. Going into, going from the narrative again, it's literally called the narrative mode to the conflict mode can be very jarring. And in fact, something that Smith has talked about, uh, and my experience was this as well, is sometimes if your group isn't ready for that or your group doesn't want that, it could be a little, like you get whiplash, right? Like you're like, oh, okay, yeah, we get this. This is kind of like a kind of a loosey-goosey indie game, little, little fate aspects, little approaches, kind of got some Powered by the Apocalypse thing. And then boom, suddenly you're in this pretty crunchy kind of realistic element of of the of the combat in this case the skirmish mode uh, of how all these items and weapons and armor and stuff all interlink and interact um but uh let's 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 try it out so let's say that we have matsusuke here who is um they are uh, attacking a uh this what, what was this person called a day a, a, a Sorry, it was called a desperate bandit. Sorry, I had to look it up. Um, and this character is a minion, which again means it doesn't get the same amount of, uh, you know, uh, stuff uh, as, a, as a full character would get. By the way, an interesting thing just to compare uh, between our characters, you can see that the my character has 65 honor. The desperate bandit only has 15, which is essentially uh, so dishonorable as to almost be... Uh, without you know they're not a demonic being of 
of chaos and destruction, uh, but they are about as dishonorable as you can be. Um, our glory, which is our character's sort of renown and reputation, is also pretty low. This is just some lowly bandit. And our status uh, is 35 and 1. And 1 status is basically uh, reserved for the lowest that you could possibly go and still be considered uh, to be a member of society, uh, which is 1. So our character being a, a scoundrel, a criminal with no place in the ordered society of our world has a status of 1. And believe it or not, the differences between these things can influence the way that certain techniques and certain skill checks can interact within the concept of the game. There are certain things that matter if my status or my glory or whatever is higher than another character's. Um, it can change the effectiveness of certain skills in, in, in certain circumstances. So these things are also, these things can all be pretty important. By the way, while we're here and we're taking a look at this NPC, um, I do want to highlight a couple differences. I know... Uh, this is not necessarily about the scene, but I do want to point this out. So our character has skills. They have artisan skills, martial skills, scholarly skills, social skills, and yes, trade skills. And they are broken down in most cases into four or five uh, separate su skills that sort of, okay, this is aesthetics, this is composition, this is design, this is smithing. And these are all skills that you would take individually. The way NPCs work is they just get a ranking for that whole category. The game is not going to bog you down with knowing that this character has a two in design, but only a one in smithing, but has a three in composition because they really wanted to be a writer. They would just say their artisan value is two. So in this case, we don't actually know this desperate bandit essentially is a one skill in all the martial uh, techniques. We don't need to know what they're unarmed or the meditation or the tactics. When it, when it, when and when it's it's just one. So instead of having to know twenty seven different skills for each NPC, you only need to know these five. Uh, you know what's their martial, what's their scholar, what's their social, what's their trade. And so if this desperate bandit wanted to make a martial attack using their fire ring, uh, we would just say okay, fire martial. And, and we're done, right? It's, it's, it, we're good. So that's pretty easy, uh, and, and that makes it a lot easier. Um, well, here's what's interesting, Ben. How is this bandit going to expos exposit their life story before they fight to the death then? Well, unlike your D20-based games, these, uh, even a minion, like this desperate bandit, has these... Uh, distinctions and adversities. In this case, and this this is the this is a role playing instruction, and it's a mechanical role playing instruction. But it is a it, so it's again, it's just like what I was talking about earlier about how something is both when I was talking about composure and gaining strife, and once your strife exceeds your composure, you become compromised, which is a condition which exists in the game and has a mechanical benefit. Well, it's a penalty actually, but it has a mechanical effect. But it also is an instructional element to you, the player, of how to play your character differently now. You don't get to just decide. I mean, you could, but then you're just a bad player and you're a bad role player. This game says you are role playing poorly. You are playing your character badly because your character has the compromise condition. And that means mechanically, you can't keep dice with strife symbols on them. But it also means that your character is compromised, damn it. So play it like that. Well, this NPC sheet tells us everything that we need to know about playing this desperate bandit. For starters, it gives us his rings, which kind of indicate to us which elements or areas that they are particularly, in this case, it's pretty pretty boring because all of them are two, except for void, which is one, which means, okay, this character is not very spiritually enlightened. One is the lowest you can go. It tells us that our character, this guy is ambitious. That's the character's demeanor. We talked about this when we talked about the skill checks before. If we zoom in, it's a little probably tough to see, but we can see this character is ambitious. If you take, if you use water actions against them, the TN, that's the target number, the DC, will go down by two. By the way, the default TN for most things in the game is two. That means if you use the right approach against this character, the difficulty class drops to zero. 
It's almost guaranteed, it, it is basically guaranteed success if you use the right thing. But why does water work against them? Because they're ambitious. They've got big plans. They've got big dreams. And when you're using a water-based approach against this character, you're basically telling them what they want to hear. You're being very gregarious and you're being very understanding and you're listening and you're telling them what they want to hear. Similarly, fire goes up by two because fire is all about you know, your ideas and your plans and your cre you know, your creativity and your inventiveness. This character doesn't want to hear about your big plans. They want to hear about their big plans. But we also have, this character has a distinction and two adversities. The distinction is nothing to lose. And the adversity is a fool's avarice and quarrelsome. Remember, we talked about these as well. Distinctions and adversities can be used to re-roll dice or that uh, basically take shitty dice that rolled badly and re-roll them. Or adversities could be used to take good dice that you want to keep and re-roll them so that they're bad. But these also do a great job of telling us this character's mindset and where these things would apply. So this character has nothing to lose. And it's a, it's a mental benefit that applies for martial and social-based skills. So when this character is going into combat, yeah, maybe I'm going to re-roll some attack dice. Why? He has nothing to lose, right? Like, this just applies. This character is going, you know, full out. On the same time, if you're trying to, if this character is, you know, trying to, uh, uh, you know, make a peaceful offering to somebody, maybe he has to re-roll two dice that were successful and take the worst because he's quarrelsome and he tends to get into fights and is kind of, well, kind of combative and, and, and bellicose. Uh, but he's also a fool and has the, the you know, the avarice and the, uh, you know, the greed and the, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, foolish dreams that only a, a bandit could have. So these things tell us so much about this NPC, and this is all part of their stat block. And just really quickly, you can just read what they gain as a distinction. You can read what they gain as an adversity. You can read their demeanor. You can take a look at their social standing. And you can take a look at their rings and boom, you have a pretty good sense of who or what this desperate bandit is. And this is just some random minion, right? Like if we look at something like Hatsu over here, um, oh, I didn't write down Hatsus from the, from the character. But if we looked at the trained Ashigaru, our trained Ashigaru is a gruff, gruff Ashigaru. So, you know, he's, it's. It's uh, it's <laughs> remember how the ambitious person. It was really easy to use water. Flattery will get you everywhere with this person. This this is a trained Ashigaru. This is a soldier soldier who's been in a million different battles for a million different lords. He's just seen it all. He's gruff. If you try to use flattery and watery words, and he, that TN goes up by two. But if you use an earth based approach. If you just tell it to him like it is, you talk to him straight, you give him the what you just give him the information, what he needs to know, the difficulty number goes down by T2. This character is basically Ron Swanson, right? And if we look at the character's uh distinctions, they have strength in numbers as a distinction, and they have as an adversity jaded by battle. So we can use these distinctions and adversities, we can use their demeanor. And again, we can use their stats, their rings, and their social standing, I think, to give us a good indication of how we need to play this character and how we should show, play this character. All right. I promised you, I promised you we'll show, well, I promised you we would show something before we, before we ended tonight. So, all right. So here is, uh, here is our, our samurai Matsusuke. And this uh, desperate bandit has been, uh, you know, uh, taken robbing from this village and my samurai has confronted him. And uh, again, we could use the dual rules here, but we're going to show the skirmish rules for, for purposes of this. Um, he, um, so we've got um, my character here, Masusuke and my character wants to, uh, you know, we've won initiative and my character wants to, you know, hack down this bandit. Now, again, this isn't the Pathfinder 2 module. There's no really super easy, quick, convenient way to just sort of do all this. Um, so we do have to kind of, uh, you know, take certain um, liberties with how we're, we're playing this and using this sheet, unlike uh, with our normal game. Okay, so Matsusuke, we're in conflict. Um, I'm going to be in my fire stance, and that means my character is being aggressive and is being really hot-headed and you know, is, is 
kind of aggressively getting in their face. And you can see here that the effect of being in the fire stance is that if I succeed at an action, I get a bonus success for every strife symbol on the dice that I have kept. This means that when you're in the fire stance, if you're willing to let your emotions get hot, you can actually come up with some really, really big numbers. Bonus successes in combat usually mean doing extra points of damage. Bonus successes in other uh, types of scenes could mean potentially, you know, uh, uh, defeating a social challenge in a single check. So being in the fire stance is sort of your way of basically saying my character is kind of kind of leading with their emotions. They're leading with their 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 vigor and their fight. It's actually kind of in many ways the opposite of the void stance. You can see here in a void stance, you do not receive strife from symbols on your dice. So if you're in the strife uh, void stance and you roll a bunch of strife symbols, your character does not gain strife. Their char your character is calm and quiet and centered. But remember, if my character was in the void stance, I would have to be rolling with only one void die. My character being a, a, a hot-headed lion clan Matsu berserker, not really known for being quiet and meditative, right? They are known for being very, very fiery and, and, and kind of uh, hot-headed. So fire seems to be pretty appropriate here. So I'm in the fire stance. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make a melee check, in this case, martial arts melee. So here we are, martial arts melee. And again, uh, the default assumption in the game is that the difficulty number is two. And attacking in combat is always difficulty two. Um, unless you have a technique or a school, because remember, like we said before, if your character was in the air stance, then the the TN or the difficulty number to uh, attack you goes up by one. Actually, if your air stance is high enough, your difficulty number goes up by two, which is a lot in this game. Uh, so the air stance is your character sort of being more evasive. But in this case, it's fire uh, and the difficulty number is two. So we have fire selected, not air. We have fire. So we have three black ring dice and then our martial arts melee skill, which is what we're using here, has two as our rank. So we've got two points or two dice two of the white d12s the skill dice for our martial arts melee now remember we're going to roll five dice three black dice six siders and two white dice 12 siders but from that pool of five dice we only get to keep as many dice as our rings is so because we're rolling three black dice we get to keep three dice total so here we go we just rolled and here are the five dice that we rolled. We've got our first die. These are our three black ring dice. And here are our two white skill dice. So um, we've got, sorry, I lost my mouse cursor here. So our first die here shows a strife symbol. Remember, this is in the lower left-hand corner. It's always in the lower left-hand corner. The single leaf from the cherry blossom uh, shows uh, strife. So this first die has a point of has a strife symbol on it, but it also has the chrysanthemum flower, which is an opportunity. We talked about these in the first uh, uh, live stream. An opportunity is not a success. An opportunity is an additional benefit. It could be narrative, it could be mechanical, but it is not success. If we took these dice and we ended up with three opportunity we would not have succeeded we will not have hit our opponent right but maybe we gain some sort of advantage or a new opportunity or we learn something about the opponent opportunities are a way for the game to basically say you didn't succeed but you get something else instead our second die is the zen circle which represents success the third die is the blank. The, the only sim, there's only one symbol on the whole D6 that has nothing on it. And that's this one. And then the next two from our white skill dice are a success each, but also a strife symbol. Now remember, strife is bad. It means our character is going to uh, gain uh, 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 strife and become closer to being compromised. But remember that we are in the fire stance. 
And when we are in the fire stance, for each strife that we keep or gain from an action, we get a bonus success. So it almost means that these dice kind of count as two successes each. So if I come in and I take this success and this success and this die, I've taken one, two, three successes. Remember, the target number is two. It tells us this up in the upper right-hand corner. So we only need two successes to hit this bandit with our katana. But uh, we are going to gain two points of strife. But because we are in the fire stance, when we take those two points of strife, the number of successes that we get will actually go from three, one, two, three. But because we're in the fire stance, that strife, that passion, that fury actually aids us and we'll actually end up with five successes. So we finalize this, and then now it's asking us how we wanna deal with our strife. In this case, we're gonna apply it, we're gonna take it. So we take the strife, and you can see here this little blue bar on the top represents how much strife my character has. Uh, you can see now that our strife is at two points out of 10, so we gained a little bit of strife. Um, and so our character succeeded and you'll see that it says here in the in the chat bar, success, one bonus success. It the the uh, UI does not know that we were in fire stance. Again, this is a very primitive UI compared to what you might be concerned with with your normal Pathfinder 2 Foundry app. But we know we were in, we know that we were in fire stance. So in reality, we got a success and we actually get to add these strife symbols as bonus successes. That means we got a success with three bonus successes so that's a ton so now we look at our katana and our katana here we could see um uh has a uh damage which is kind of in the oh, oh, oh we can't see it never mind sorry i gotta move my character sheet there we go uh on the right hand side you can see that the katana has a damage value of four that means that our katana deals four points of damage when it hits somebody and the way that the game works is for each bonus success you get over and above uh, your uh, target, you get to do an additional point of damage. We do a base damage of four. And then because we got three bonus successes, we actually do seven points of damage. So we do seven points of fatigue damage to this bandit. Now, this bandit is wearing traveling clothes, which give him a... Uh, physical resistance of two. So he gets to take two points of damage off from the seven that we just dealt it. And he would take one, two, three, four, five fatigue. So one of the important things that actually is kind of cool about this game is you're not actually hitting the character. When a weapon connects with a, a character in Legend of the Five Rings, that is a critical hit. You don't get hacked by a sword and keep going. The reason why you take fatigue is because this represents the fact that our character struck and this desperate bandit was basically forced to block and parry and fall back and become winded and maybe beat up and bruised a little bit, but he wasn't actually hacked by this katana, okay? Because if a character gets hacked by a katana, they are actually going to like lose limbs and they are going to like bleed out and die. So the game, when you score a critical hit in this game, and I'm not going to get into the details of this, but when a katana actually hits and does a critical hit, your character is messed up. And in many cases, permanently. So when you, if coming, like for example, if this desperate bandit were to critically hit my character, uh, my character could lose a, lose an arm, lose an eye. They could lose a, you know, they could bleed out. They could bleed to death. Like, Fighting is very, very, very dangerous. And again, there's no regeneration spells. There's no, you know, I'll just pay 20 gold at the town and get a potion of regeneration. I'll sleep it off and long rest. I'll be fine in the morning. No. In fact, when you gain, if you lose like a limb, you, you take a new disadvantage and draw it onto your character and drag it onto your character and say, okay, my character just doesn't have a limb anymore. Um, it's very, very brutal. Um, but in any case, let me, I didn't do this here, but in any case, this character, um, now has five points 
of fatigue. So their character, uh, my character starts attacking them with a katana and does so proficiently and expertly enough that this desperate bandit is sort of forced to, uh, you know, give up or gain fatigue instead of be, uh, be, instead of being hacked. So, you know, we are sword fighting here. We are, du you know, we're sparring, we're dueling, uh, we're engaged in a, in a combat here. My character did not just go and hack through this character because if I had, the results would have been far, far, far worse. Um, in fact, let me bring up my Ledge of the Five Rings uh, CRB here. I'm going to expand this a bit Doo -doo -doo. all right so here's our here's our legend of the five rings crb if we go to page 269 in our core rule book uh which is actually 270 of the PDF, we could see here the results of a critical strike. Um, if your weapon critically strikes somebody um, uh, at the lowest tier, it's a close call. The hit slices the character's hair or clothes, but fares to draw blood. And if they're wearing armor, the armor becomes damaged. Once you get even to a, a severity three or four critical hit, the character takes a flesh wound. And you start to take, you become wounded. And that's not like hit point damage. That's not endurance damage. That's not fatigue. You're just wounded. If you get a five or a six, you're severely wounded and you can bleed out to death. Once you get to severity seven, and by the way, a katana is severity seven. So that means that the minimum, the minimum that a katana can do to you most of the time is permanent injury. If you're lucky and your character is very skilled and a katana hits you, actually connects with you, you might be able to be able to resist it and turn it into just a gash or a flesh wound. But most of the time, when a katana actually hits you, you will suffer permanent injury, uh, leaving you permanently injured, bearing a scar that you will bear for the rest of your life. And you gain something like maimed visage, nerve damage, damaged organ, fractured spine, lost fingers, maimed arm, lost eye, lost foot once you get above that most of them are just death um in fact the last three things in this entire chart are just various forms of dying uh if you get hit with a critical hit and the diff and the severity of that critical hit is 12 you suffer an agonizing death you're dying and you will die in three rounds if you get a 14 to 15 it's a swift death and you will die in one round and if you get a 16 plus you die immediately um and uh yeah, guess what? Stopping someone from dying? You can't just, oh, I'll drop a cure light into them. No, it's, uh, I don't want to say it's damn near impossible, but it's really, really, really hard. So combat is something that you really need to take very, very special close care and attention to. So uh, our, our samurai hacks into this guy. Um, he is going to keep going. Um he is going to go, we'll say, into uh, we'll go into the uh, air stance because he's trying to, uh, you know, play keep away. He doesn't want to be hacked by this uh, samurai again. And then he is going to roll his martial attack. So he only has two dice and one die of success or one die of skill. And again, the difficulty to attack our samurai is two. Well, they got a blank a success, oh, and they managed to get two successes on their two dice. But, um, what's going on? I don't know why this is not working. There we go. Um, so we, the, the uh, bandit will keep, will take one point of strife, but they did manage to get a success, and our bandit is attacking with a Yari. That Yari does five points of damage. Matsusuke, our samurai, is wearing lacquered armor, which has four physical resistance. So even though that Yari does five points of damage, our heavily armored samurai only has to take one point of fatigue to sort of absorb this wicked hit. All right, well, this guy's looking pretty worse to wear, so Matsusuke is going to finish it off. So again, 
There are techniques, there are katas that can modify all of this. You're not just usually doing basic strikes. Um, I'm just doing this for simplicity's purposes. Um, we were in fire before. We're going to switch over to earth. Actually, well, let's see. Because, right, the TN to hit this bandit now is three. So we're going to stay in fire because we want to make sure that we can actually get a success on this. And we're going to... um. We're going to overwhelm them with our martial arts melee. Again, three rings, two skills, but the difficulty number is going to go up to three because the bandit is an air stance. We roll, and remember, we get to keep three dice. Ooh, this is great. This is a good example of this. So we're going to take this die, this skill die here, because it has a success and a strife. But why would we take that die when we could take... I don't know how to clear this. When we could take this die instead... This die, the one on the far right, has a success and an opportunity. Opportunities are great. We could also take this die, which is just a free success. And then, I guess discard. Yeah, there we go. And what we want to really take is this die here in the middle. This die has the, the three swirling vortex of explosive success. This is sort of how the game can get kind of you know fun. Dice can explode in this way. So even though we are roll, we only get to keep three dice because we rolled three black die. Right now we are sitting on one success, one success, one success, one point of strife, one point of opportunity. But that success is one of them is an explosive success, and so. That explosive success turned into another success, and we get to keep that die. Even though we are now keeping four dice, as successes explode, you get to keep them if you want to, even if it goes above what you're originally allowed. If that had been an ex as explosive success, we would have got to keep that as well. So now we have a lot of successes. This is fantastic. Um, we're going to take the strife. So we succeeded. We succeed with, uh, we have one, even remember this person was, in their air stance. They were actually hard to hit and we succeeded with a bonus success and we got a point of strife. So we actually count that as an additional bonus success because of our fire stance. So again, we succeeded and we did it with two bonus successes. That means we deal six points of damage to this desperate bandit. Their armor, which is just heavy clothing is two. So they are going to take four points of fatigue. And now you can see that their fatigue is higher than their endurance, and this bandit would now become incapacitated. This bandit, uh, it, because it's a minion, uh, it means that we take them out. And if we take them out with a weapon which is deadliness seven or higher, which our katana is, according to the rules of the game, they are killed. Now, if this was a adversary or like a um, um, important NPC, you might roll to see what actually happened to them. They, you might have to roll on the critical hit table and determine, you know, did you strike them down and, you know, cut through their armor and cut into their arm and now they're bleeding? Did you roll high enough that you just cut their head off clean off and they don't get to say anything? With adversaries, it's a little bit more procedural because these are presumably characters that might be important enough that they could survive, they could come back, and all this other stuff. With a minion, you just hack them down, clean them up, and that's the end of the story. And uh, our Matsusuke has defeated the Desperate Bandit. Now, he's picked up a point of fatigue, and he's picked up a little bit of strife because of uh, being in fire stance and, and wanting to keep those strife symbols. Uh, so he's a little bit, you know, maybe, you know, he's probably not scared, right? But he's probably feeling a little amped. He's a Matsu berserker. He's feeling like, oh man, that was great. You know, I got to, mm, I got to take somebody out. It was great. Uh, you know, I, I was, you know, yelling my lion battle roar and I'm feeling a little, the adrenaline is pumping. Uh, now, it's well within his character's ability to, to handle because they have composure of 10, but if we had, if things had worked out differently, if there were more, uh, more bandits to fight, uh, maybe our character would have been like at nine strife out of 10. And now they're like, okay, I'm really, 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 really amped up, uh, close to being compromised and close to just losing my samurai cool and calm. But the good news is that at the end of every scene, um, your composure or your endurance, I should say, your fatigue or your strife, if it is over half uh, of what your max is, 
uh, it goes down to your half. So after the scene is done, my fatigue would stay at one, but my composure would, my strife would come back down to five as soon as the scene was completed. Um, and, uh, you, you know, you're basically, ex exactly, Ragan, you're, you're, you have a moment to cure, you know, the, the fatigue and the, and the, and the strife that the, you're hyped up. You basically have a moment to, to, to basically gather yourself. Hey, John, it makes sense that after a fight, you're suffering from fatigue and strife. A hundred percent. And in fact, Rag and Wolfbane, there is an action that you can take in combat called take a breath. And when you take a breath, you heal one point of strife and one point of fatigue. So in a combat, if you have the opportunity to, uh, your character can basically take the action and just kind of go. And that heals you for a little bit in the middle of a combat. Um, so that is actually an option that your character can take during combat. So after a combat, we just assume that our character does that a couple of times. Um, and this would also be true for any conflict. If we had just fought a duel or if we had just engaged in a massive intrigue, right? After a massive intrigue, our endurance is probably fine. We probably haven't taken much fatigue, but maybe after an incredibly hectic morning, by the way, combat rounds aren't defined as six seconds like they are in Pathfinder 2 or one minute like they are in first edition D&D. It's pretty flexible. Um, I think the idea is that in a skirmish, each round is probably, you know, 15 to 20 seconds, right? It's supposed to be pretty action-packed, swords, clink, 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 clink. Whereas a mass combat, a round might be an hour or like a half a day. Whereas in an intrigue, it might represent 15 minutes or half an hour, each round being like, as you go through the morning's proceedings at the, you know, at the, in the, in the, in the negotiation table. And, you know, the, the first fight of the day was just the morning session and everybody, you know, breaks for lunch. That's the end of the first combat, which was social. Everybody takes a moment, their composure, their endurance. And this is where other elements of the game come in. For example, we talked about this in um, in the 20 question stream. You know, your character has things like their passions, their anxieties, their giris. These are things that they can use to keep to heal and recover from their strife. So after, let's say, a very tense set of negotiations or an incredibly difficult combat or maybe a, a, a horrific day of battle in mass combat. Uh, maybe my character was at nine strife and after the combat or after they should say after the conflict scene, it goes down to five and the GM says, okay, um, that scene's over. We're into a more narrative scene. What are you guys doing? Like the, the, the day's combat is over. Well, remember my character has as a passion, uh, Chamai, which is the, the tea ceremony. And so maybe Matsusuke retires to his personal tent and removes his helm and sets down his blood and mud stained weapons has his you know assistant uh help strip him of his armor and enters and you know begins preparing tea for himself uh and maybe for a fellow samurai who he respects uh just to enjoy the moment of culture and civilization in this other in this battlefield full of death and blood and bodies that is my character's passion. My character's passionate about the tea ceremony. And when you indulge in your passion, you reduce your strife by three points. So that would reduce my character's strife from five to two. Because my character is, he's clearing his head. He's engaging in it. Every character is going to have different passions and different anxieties. And there's going to be different ways for you to manage this. There's also talents feats you know uh they're called techniques in the game that you can use in order to restore and recover your abilities so that is just a high level concept of what conflicts are in this system and i do want to address ben's question from the beginning of the stream he asked about mass combat and about fields of victory and i want to talk about that a little bit um legend of the five rings has a couple of uh, like five or six uh, supplement books out. And one of them is this book called Fields of Victory, which is about the Lion Clan. But at a higher level, it's about combat, battle, 
War. I mentioned that there are four conflict types in the core rulebook of Legend of the Five Rings. There is the skirmish, there is the intrigue, there is the duel, and then there is the mass combat. The mass combat, as presented in this book, is very much a high-level mass combat conflict. It really focuses on the PCs with the war or the battle going on kind of around them. I would say the mass combat rules in the core rulebook sort of assume that your character is a, a combatant in the battle, not really a commander. They aren't the ones making the big decisions. You're sort of, uh, you know, defending the wall. You know, you might be still leading the, the band of Ashigaru spearmen that are, you know, standing with you on the wall, but you are not in the general's tent, okay? You're fighting in the war. You might have to rally, you know, the men around you. You might have to, you know, capture a critical hill, but you're sort of a player in the, in the um, you know, you're just a, a player on the stage, a pawn, eh, maybe a knight uh, on the chessboard. Fields of Victory, which is uh, a book about the Lion Clan who are all about warfare, sort of create gives you an optional rule or I should say an optional set of rules for your mass combat conflict and instead replaces them and I'm looking for it here with basically a full on war game um and basically it like gives you instructions and rules for how to create um maps and battle zones and territories and like you're going to be moving your units to capture key positions on that battlefield which give your you certain combat victory points that you can use in order to secure victory of the field it has rules for like you know raising an army and marching and your supply wagon and your supply train and your uh you know keeping your army you know, disciplined and together and fighting off starvation and wounded and blah, 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 blah. Uh, the fields of victory, I would say uh, advanced variant to the mass combat system is really more about putting the players in the, in the, in the general seat, in the leader's seat, or at the very least at the leader's table. Um, they are part of the upper echelon of command. They are helping to make the cre the key critical decisions about where units should be moved and stuff like that. So if you want sort of more of an, of a war game, uh, you know, sort of more of a war game aspect to your mass combats, then I think the Fields of Victory book and its mass combat section uh, or I said, its mass combat system are definitely what you want to take a look at. If you want mass combat as sort of more of a thing that's going on around you and you don't want to get into like the, I move my piece here and I'm trying to you know secure the flank. And you know if you don't want that war game aspect, I think the mass combat rules in the core rule book work fine. Uh, and to be fair, I think one of the fun things about Legend of the Five Rings is you and your players uh, can talk before you play the game about what, you know, about what kind of campaign you want to have. If you want to have a campaign that's focused on, you know, epic battles, mass combats of, you know, lines and of samurai warriors and Ashigaru spearmen clashing of, of battles of honor and skirmishes and fights, you say, hey guys, maybe we play... Maybe we play a lion-based campaign, or maybe we, we all make lion characters because that is a big part of what their clan identity is and what they do. On the other hand, if you want to have a campaign about duels and, and scheming and intrigues and politics and, well, maybe you make a scorpion clan uh, campaign or a crane clan campaign because those clans tend to be more involved with governmental business and uh, with politics and intrigue certainly if you want to do a campaign about stealthy ninja and shinobi shenanigans you would do something you know scorpion clan if you want to have a campaign that's all about fighting monsters and killing demons and ogres and troll you would play a crab campaign which isn't to say that you couldn't do a crab campaign and make it about politics i mean you could do that too but i do think that um i think setting the expectation with your players 
is an important part of this game because if you tell your players, hey, this is going to be a really, really politics focused, intrigue focused game, uh, you know, then your characters are definitely going to want to uh, maybe look at some of the, you know, the samurai schools that are courtiers and have more social abilities and social skills. And even if they make a warrior, uh, maybe they will pick more social skills that'll help them in those intrigue conflicts and not just in the skirmish conflicts, help them build the samurais that they're going to be able to do well and succeed. Now, part of the beauty of the system is you can throw any sort of real challenge at the samurai. They'll, they'll be better at some and worse at others, but ultimately you could take any character, a, a samurai who is a courtier. Uh, and if you buy them enough ranks in, uh, martial arts melee they are going to be able to wield a katana just fine um and in fact uh hey scratch paper games uh just gotta say thanks uh thank you for the super chat thanks just gotta say thanks for talking about other game systems beyond the big two over the last 10 years i've mostly focused on homebrewing but videos like this have been very helpful and enlightening well i'm glad to do it um i understand that these videos do not get the kind of audience that our um pathfinder 2 uh, videos do we don't really we don't really talk that much about fifth edition on this channel we've done a couple of videos and we've talked about one D&D um, and maybe we'll talk more a little bit about it in the future depending on what our patrons are interested in um, but I know that for me personally a big part of Knights of Last Call is exploring and understanding other systems both because they're awesome in their own right but also because I think that that is a great gold mine as you said Scratch Paper to uh get new ideas of how role-playing games can be used and, you know, should be used. And I think that helps, you know, raise the IQ level of game masters and players so that your next homebrew, maybe go, I really like that system from that RPG. I'm not ready to play that RPG or maybe my group has no interest in playing that RPG. We want to play D and D, but I think I could take that system and modify it and, and play with it. And, and I think I could homebrew something cool and I like being exposed to new ideas and that's what makes it so much fun. And I really, really like that. So Revo Grim to $10. You hey. must understand that there is more than one path to the top of the mountain. Miyamoto Musashi. <laughs> exactly. Nice nice way to end it there, Revo, with a, 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 a quote from Mio, Miyamoto Musashi. Um, appreciate that. Yeah, um, exactly. I think you're both saying the same thing. I appreciate the tip, Revo, as well, uh, from that... I think learning about role-playing games makes you a better Pathfinder 2 player. It makes you a better D&D player. Um, I would never say that you sh these games are better than those games. And I would never say that if you're having fun and you're playing D&D that you're doing something wrong. Uh, you playing D&D, you might be having a lot more fun than I've ever had in my whole life playing role-playing games. In which case, that's awesome. But these, uh, these games are out there and I think they're worth taking a look at. And I think they do certain things particularly well. If there is one critique I will make... It's that tool. we have a variety of tools at our disposal for a reason. And we live in an era where we have more role-playing game systems available to us than ever before. And the same way that if I go down into a machinist shop or a woodworker shop or uh, to an embroiderer's uh, shop, they are going to have a variety of tools to handle different needs and problems and situations and things like that nature. Um, Role-playing games do the same thing. Certain role-playing games are just are better at handling other things. Can another system handle uh, Samurai Bushido Honorable Warfare? Sure. Does Legend of the Five Rings do it better? Yes. Does that mean it's the right system for you? Maybe not. If you don't care about that stuff, then of course it's not. Or maybe the cost for picking up a new book and learning a new system and finding a group. Those are real costs. I'm not going to argue with you. Um, I will say that if you're interested in trying to play more games, one of the things that I'm definitely trying to do with our KOLC Patreon is to try to play and, and encourage more games in our, in our community system. We usually have at least a couple of games a month from some crazy system that most people have never heard of. Uh, and, you know, we just, Ben, who's in chat, at least twice a month is running games from Call of Cthulhu or running games from Powered by the Apocalypse or running just a crazy array of games, Star Trek, uh, 2D20 system, Star Trek. So there is an opportunity to come in our Patreon and learn some of these games. And it's something that I want to continue to grow and push and develop because I think it does 
I, I think it I think it makes you a better 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 role play and game player. And I like to embrace people embrace the hobby and not just a game. And so the same way that I would encourage someone who's serious about their woodworking to pick up a variety of saws and bits and drivers and hammers, you know, not just to rely on one single tool because there are tools that make the job a lot easier. And sometimes you might find yourself frustrated with your role-playing game. And it's not because you're doing anything wrong. It's just because you're trying to use the game in a way that is, you're kind of ice skating uphill. And there are systems out there that just do those things flawlessly, easily, smoothly. And if that's what you're really passionate about, and that's the kind of uh, narrative game that you and your friends want to experience, then I would suggest taking a look at some of these other systems. And if you're interested in exploring samurai drama and understanding and simulating and feeling the pressures and challenges of being someone who follows and, and, and exists in a world of Bushido, then I highly recommend Legend of the Five Rings 5th Edition by Edge Studios. If you just want to dip your toe in, you're not ready to make the big leap yet, then I, I can recommend Adventures in Rokugan, also by Edge Studios. It uses the Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition engine, you know, strength decks, int con, whiz, charisma, uh, hit dice, the whole nine yards. It's a fun game. It's got a lot of the cool world elements of Legend of the Five Rings. They did a good job. It is D&D. A lot of the things that we talked about tonight about strife and composure and demeanor and, uh, uh, you know, opportunities and narrative events. And none of that is in that game. <laughs> that game is just, you know, instead of a fighter and a cleric, you're a samurai and a, a you know, a priest or a, you know, a spirit priest or an elemental priest uh, or, you know, a pilgrim. It's not, it's not the same on that scale. It has a lot of the same um, elements of of the world building, but in terms of what you know, Aaron and I like to call, uh, I think Dave, I think Dave Thomavor reviews called it a bushido simulator, um, and I, I think it's probably even better to call it a samurai drama. And samurai drama usually means the the the, the conflict between bushido and being a human being. Uh, but I, I, I think it, calling it a Bushido simulator or a samurai drama emulator, I think both of those are very appropriate terms. That being said, the conflict scenes can be pretty crunchy. And if your characters, I mean, I, I really just dipped my toe in here because your characters can have these techniques like katas and sujis, which you can use in order to do kind of cool combos and special attacks and all the kind of kind of cool stuff that you might usually do in like a Pathfinder 2 game, uh, you can do in this game as well through your katas and through uh, your, your other techniques. So if you are looking for that crunchier aspect, it's there in the conflict scenes. In the narrative scenes, I feel like it's a lot more freewheeling. And so Legend of the Five Rings exists in this strange space where Half the game feels like this really lightweight indie game. And the other half of the game feels like a fairly crunchy, it's not full grid base because it uses those range bands, but it's a fairly crunchy, fairly tactical kind of, uh, you know, uh, board game element to it. Uh, and, you know, that could be very jarring. And it was something that we, when we played Legend of the Five Rings, we did not fully appreciate the, si the size of that shift. And so I think that you need to be respectful of that. Um, oh, my dog just came up and started grabbing my hand. Uh, Ragan says, I really like the system and I like the soft ways for players to engage in PvP. It doesn't have to be combat, which has violence, but possibly social combat. Absolutely. In fact, Ragan Wolfbane, one of the things that we did not talk about um, is you in this game can even potentially make checks or engage in an intrigue against your fellow players to change their character's mind. Which I know is kind of crazy for a lot of people because they're used to playing role-playing games where whatever I think, my character thinks. Whatever I want to do, my character will do. I'm just, that's like, my character is a complete, total, you know, marionette automaton 
of me. And whatever I want, if I want to have, if I want my character to just jump off a cliff and dash themselves against the rocks, they will do it. I have complete dominion and control over my player character. Um, in Legend of the Five Rings, that is not always the case. In Legend of the Five Rings, like I said, if your character is compromised, the expectation is that you will play them differently. Well, similarly, if another player makes a check against you and succeeds, then they can the change. They can basically kind of create a binding situation where your character, like, yeah, I've changed your character's mind. Um, I've I've convinced your character to go with us. When a player gets into an intrigue, sometimes it could be an intrigue against them. The samurai go, you know, to the imperial city where they are to be commended for their recent victories against the, uh, you know, or maybe not the imperial city because that would be the lion clan generals are invited to attend a great, great feast being held at, uh, you know, uh, Dawn's Last Breath Castle, the 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 capital of the lion clan, where they are to be commended for their great victory against the recent the battles against the crane and the great battles that they have won. And while you are there, the Daimyo's wife tries to seduce you to get you to do something. Well, I'm like, you're being attacked. How are you being? Oh, I draw my katana. No, 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 no. You're not being attacked in combat. You're being attacked in social combat. This character is entering against you to try to get you to do something. And just like how in combat, you're like, well, I don't want my character to die. It doesn't matter. If the rules say that your character is at zero hit points or dying four, it doesn't matter what you think, your character is dead. It doesn't matter about what you thought about your characters. Well, my character wouldn't just die from a sword thrust like that. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, the same thing is true in this game. The, uh, you know, the maybe the, the real manipulative, worm-tongue-esque uh, chancellor, you know, of the, you know, the sort of servant little... Uh, you know, very uh, spiteful, vile little man uh, who serves as like the Hatamoto to the daimyo comes over to you and starts whispering poison words into your ear. Your intrigue might be to see, hey, do you guys not go for his bullshit or do you go for his bullshit? And if you lose the intrigue, it's just like losing a combat. The GM gets to go, well, you're all dead because you ran out of hit points. Well, if you lose the intrigue, the GM gets to go, you guys all agree to go go along with this guy's plan because you lost. I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. Like try harder next time. I don't know. Make build better characters. I don't. So it's uh, it could be a very weird experience for a lot of players for sure. Uh, John says trying new TTRPGs is always a good thing. I completely agree with that. Of course. Um, we'll say my friends were into the idea of the system and then adventures came out and now they want to play that instead because it is 5e well rag and wolfbane i think it's a good in between it's not what we discussed tonight but it is i think a good in between uh would you say it's a rules medium system then no no i actually think it's a pretty rule i think it's actually a pretty rules deep system actually it is actually a really pretty robust system in fact, I think some people have a problem with it because it is too rules complex. In fact, part of the reason, Ragan, that I am so enamored after reading Root, which, by the way, that all stemmed, by the way, 100% from Ben. The whole Root thing, the Root obsession, the fact that we're going to be playing a Root game, all came from Ben, uh, who played it and had a great time. And then I picked it up and I read it. I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Uh, blown away. But my whole obsession with wanting to convert Legend of the Five Rings into a PBTA game via root as sort of a translation uh, comes because while I think this game is amazing and incredible, sometimes I think it, it is, it is too complex for what I want to do with it. Um, there are elements of the game that are just too gamey and too simulation. -y, actually, like in my mind, actually the reason why I say I ledge of the five rings, I score the highest on my GNS score of any game. It it somehow feels like an extremely in-depth, deep, crunchy, mechanical game with incredible, amazing narrative forward mechanics which push you towards role playing and story creation and at the same time also has elements which feel like they are modeling the danger and deadliness of samurai combat, but like I said, S can also be E emulation. Also does a job of sort of making you feel like 
and deal with the drama and the issues and the pressure that a samurai would actually have to deal with in sort of a fantasy contextual concept. Somehow it does it all. And just sometimes you're like, this is almost too much. You have to be with the right group of players. I mean, this this is not a game. It's not a game for kids. This is not a game for newbies. Sorry. The beginner's box set does a really great job, but you, you really, you gotta, you gotta, you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound with this one. So, uh, Golden Monkey is a 5e version more constricting with the narrative elements. Golden Monkey, I don't know exactly what you mean, but I'll say this. The 5e version is like D&D, but with like samurai ver people. Like it doesn't have any of these demeanors, natures, distinctions, adversity. It's just fifth edition. Like you have a class, it gets a couple features. Um, you have a background, you get some ASIs. You could take, like, they have a couple feats. Um, it's, it's, you know, and the expectation is you're going to be, you know, <laughs> Hacking through people. It has a lot of the, I think it does, for fifth edition, I think it does a great job, but it, it is at the end of the day limited by that system. In fact, the game designer for the fifth edition version also wrote uh, the this book. He wrote both of them and he was on a great podcast. It's a Legend of the Five Rings podcast. And they interviewed him and they said, you know, uh, you wrote the book, whatever. And he goes, yeah, I wrote the book. I mean, look, I'm not, you know, this is the game designer. He said, look, I'm not gonna lie to you. Like D&D, is not meant to do what Legend of the Five Rings does. Like Dungeons and Dragons doesn't have the ability to handle these complex, incredible, amazing drama narrative moments. Um, and so we could struggle, bust our way to try to make it do that. Or we could just accept that what it does, it does. And what it doesn't do, it doesn't do. And we could try to tell a Legend of the Five Rings game using D&D &D, instead of trying to turn D&D &D into Legend of the Five Rings, which would be a disaster. And I, I agree with them. And I think they I think they did a good job and succeeded. Um, this has always been a disconnect for me with D20 games. It feels clunky that you have these skills like deception and diplomacy, but somehow that's the, ex there's the expectation with these skills. Can, uh, can't be used against PCs. Yes, I very strange like when you see an npc and they have ranks in diplomacy you're like what is that even supposed to mean um there's enough people who even object <laughs> there's enough people who even object to being able to lose in combat i can only imagine how much they'd mind this a 5e conversion never truly emulates another ttrpg it's simply a way to make more money john i've i've also heard it said that the game designer has said off the record who made this like they said look we love Legend of the Five Rings, but the fact is, um, it's not. It's not. We could we could stick a five E compatible on it and sell twenty x the copies. We need to make money, and and, and we're not going to just phone it in. I think again. I said I didn't want to like it, but I did like the Adventures in Rokugan book as a D and D set in Rokugan. I thought it was fine. I thought it did a great job, but they basically made it because they needed money. They basically made it because they needed money. They just aren't selling enough volume of these books, you know, to 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 cover the cost of a production house. And they can sell a 5e book and, you know, they'll do what they do. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Strat says, just don't let the PCs use deception and intimidate on NPCs either, and the problem of the imbalance is fixed. Right, and the problem with that, though, is then you end up with, where you're like, well, okay, well, so get rid of sense motive, get rid of diplomacy, get rid of intimidate, get rid of deception, right? And then your game just becomes a combat engine. And that is why, when I critique D20 as being just a combat engine, that is why I do that. Um... Golden Monkey says, that's what I was looking to hear. I think I'll stay away from it. That is fair. <laughs> 5e compatible games are like cover songs by the Ramones, no matter no matter the song. They all end up sounding like the Ramones. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, D20 games, fifth edition compatible games, right? There's a regression towards the mean there, right? Like, there's only so much that that system, there's only so much that that system can handle before you're going, this isn't even 5e anymore, what are we even doing here? Um, 
John says the best way to run a publishing company is to moonlight it <laughs> and have a full time paying gig that pays. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing here at Night's of Last Call. I mean, we're not a publishing company, but maybe someday we will be. But, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about Pathfinder 2 and games like Legend of the Five Rings or Powered by the Apocalypse. And, you know, and Nonet does the same and Rules Lawyer does the same. But, like, I mean, to a certain extent, like, if this was trying, if I was, if this was trying to be my, and then, by the way, we have been way more successful than we would have ever hoped or thought or dreamed. And I'm sure we are probably in like the top couple of percent of most successful YouTube channels because of our patrons, because people have responded to what we're talking about. We have reached a very small number of people. We are just very lucky and blessed that that very small number of people happen to be very generous, uh, very engaged, uh, very willing to part with their hard earned money in order to support this channel. And, and, you know, the first year I ran this channel, I lost, you know, tens of thousands of dollars running it. Not many people are in a position to do that. I was able to do that because as John said, I'm moonlighting with my full-time job. I don't have kids, you know, I don't have a wife. Like I can take my money and put it into a YouTube channel. But if I was trying to make ends meet, you know, there's a couple people out there who've done it, who figured out a way to do it. And, you know, it took them five or 10 years to build up an audience. But for the most part, if you want to make money, you know, in this business, whether it's YouTube or publishing or whatever, it's got to be fifth edition. So yeah, there's the five E version of everything. And then there's the original version. I agree. Um, and I don't even like to do videos about fifth edition because I don't really play the game and I, I never got into it that much. You know, it came out. We, I was, I did the play test and then it came out and I was like, well, what's this? It didn't really seem that great to me. It felt like a massive step back or, uh, backwards. I was like, I could play second edition basically and play this. And, and we just stayed away from it. And we played other games and, you know, we played fate and legend of the five ring, you know, pathfinder two and pathfinder one. And we've played pretty much everything, but fifth edition. And now we're playing fifth edition on Fridays and it's just house ruled to all hell. You know, I mean, um, people uh, have a resilience score that they use to empower their abilities and spell casting is infinite, but when it locks, but when you fail your spell casting role to cast a spell, then you have to spend willpower, which is another derived stat. Like, yeah, it's like, what is going on here? This is not fifth edition. So I don't even feel necessarily qualified to speak on it other than my experience of, you know, uh, 30 some odd years being pretty actively engaged with role-playing games. So, um, no, yeah, what I'm, I mean, that's the question, right? I don't know. The zeitgeist seems to be, well, it's 5e compatible. If anything's 5e compatible, right? Like, if it's got strength, dex, and int, it's 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 5e compatible. And, you know, some people talk about house rule. Oh, that's the great thing about 5th edition. You can you can house rule anything you want to it, and it's still 5th edition. I don't know. I, I'm i not going to touch that one with a, you know, with a, with a 10-foot collapsible bamboo pole. We are small but fanatic. Yeah, Boothby. I mean, that's a great way to describe it. I mean, my YouTube demographics kind of show that. But um, uh, These companies will cater to 5e to pay the bills and then make their content for, they want to make for the small loyal base of players. The masses will feed our addiction to other systems. I mean, that looks to be the way we're headed. I don't know if that's good, you know, Ragan. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that makes me happy or sad or... You know, whatever. I don't know. Um, if, D if D20 is only a combat engine and you rip the combat engine apart, you are not playing 5e anymore. I mean, on that part, I definitely agree with you, Strat. Um, yeah, I don't think it's good either, but it is what it is. Oh, yeah. Miseries and Misfortunes is totally 5e compatible, Ben. Somebody be like, oh, I, I'm playing 5e and I'm using, I'm doing a historical French simulation, you know. Uh, they'll say that that's 5e compatible. Uh, okay, we got another super chat from Scratch Paper. 5e is afraid of itself. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to end this thing with a 5e rant, but like, fifth edition uh, is, it's like a politician that never takes a stand, so that you can never call them out on having, you know, a point of view, and you can't ever, you know, stick them to the wall. You can't never nail them to a cross. Because they took a stand. They never take a stand. They are everything and nothing at the same time. And 5th edition blew up. And I was there. I went 
to several conventions when fifth edition was in its very, 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 very early play test. Um, I was much more engaged going to all the conventions. I talked to these designers, I've, everybody there that I felt, I felt the energy. I'd, I'd been there. These people, D and D was on a lifeline. Fourth edition had sold horribly and wizards of the coast. I'm sure thought Dungeons and Dragons was dead. Everybody thought Dungeons and Dragons was dead. I, they in no way, shape or form expected this game to be this successful. And it was. And I think deep down inside, they don't know why. And two, maybe maybe even more chilling, maybe even more scary to them. They do know why. And they know that has nothing to do with Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. They know that people probably really should be playing other game systems. And they would actually work a lot better for the kind of campaigns and narratives that they are trying to engage with. They know that their system is shit for that. And they are just, you know, keeping their mouth shut because they do not want to rock this boat and have a bunch of people suddenly just shift. Um, and so now I think what they are trying to do is consolidate, 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 D&D &D 1, 1 D&D. &D, um, and I think they're trying to lock people in before they get, they start looking around and see these other game systems and start going, that game system, you know, you, you see people cheering themselves because they have these completely non-combative games and they have games that you know adventures that no one has to fight for and it's like i mean that's amazing that's great i mean if that's if that's what thrills you and excites you i think that's amazing i mean lawyer drama shows are some of the most popular shows on television and those don't involve combat but there's still a whole hell of a lot of drama right medical drama shows uh in D, &D terms a medical drama show is just a bunch of skill checks i mean it's they're not flanking the patient uh, to make him flat-footed against CPR. Uh, but they're still very dramatic. So you could definitely have dramatic moments with these uh, type of scenarios. But D&D &D is not the system to do it. You know, it's just not. It's just not. There's just not enough, there's not enough meat there to chew on. And so people are really just blind to the fact that they are locked into this ecosystem that, quite frankly, does not service them well. So uh, I, I think that they are afraid of itself and I think they're afraid that they don't know why they're successful and I don't think they know exactly what to do to iterate and I think they're going to try to just I don't know my instinct my instinct is telling me that one D&D is going to be a disaster at some level I don't know how yet but I just feel like it will be but this is just me um, our system is good at everything it's not great at anything I don't even know that it's good at everything you know Rag and Wolfbane I think it's like I don't think it's, I don't even think it's good at everything. Um, particularly. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, let's see. I play a homebrew version of 5e, and by homebrew, I mean I substitute every single thing in the game with SODL. Well, SOTDL is a great game. Uh, Banes and Boons are way better than Advantage and way more fun, and I love the way they stack. And I've wanted to use that in our 5th edition game, but everybody was like, no, we want to just use Advantage. And I said, all right, uh, I'm changing enough in the game system. Uh, I'll let you have that one. But I do think Banes and Boons are way better. I love the way that initiate or novice and initiate and expert classes work. I love that it goes to level 10. Um, God, I'm, I'm sure there's like five or six other things. I'm not a huge fan of the flavor, which is really built into SOTTL. Uh, I, I don't. I, the post-apocalyptic death metal blah, like that's not as much my thing but if like there was like a generic shadow of the demon lord system uh like that was you could use it for other types of systems i think that'd be great but i like rob schwab i like the stuff he's created over the years he was a designer in fourth edition he worked for green ronin for a long time he did the song of ice and fire rpg which i really also liked so it's no surprising that i like shadows uh or shadow of the demon lord um. <laughs> hey guys, I have this great 5e homebrew system for Adventures of Rogan called Legend of the Five Rings. See, it even has 5e on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you have to trick, this is not a game. Games like this, you can't trick people into playing. Like, people have to be bought in. People have to really, really buy in. Um, and if if they're not, I'm, I, I hate to say it, you're going to have a bad time and you're probably going to hate your friends because they're just not going to bring 
you know, this this game, especially Legend of the Five Rings, really changes a lot of the core assumptions that we have, especially if you're coming from a strictly D20 based game. Uh, most uh, uh, Yannick, Yannicka? Most of the hardcore 5th edition players I've met honestly haven't branched out and have been playing D&D for years. I've called it D&D Baby's First RPG for years because uh, of its mainstreaming. I mean, that is... I mean, that's the case for a lot of things, right? I mean, how many people, uh, you know, only know a handful of brands because that's the big brand, whether it's toilet paper or paper towels... I think the difference is is that something like paper towels or toilet paper, for the most part, even cars, for the most part, are fungible, right? Yeah, I mean, this car might be better than this car, but like they all do the same thing. They kind of get you to where you're going. I suppose when you start talking about like, oh, this car is a truck and is designed for hauling things and isn't as you know, fuel efficient, but it does a different job. That's kind of where we start getting into like that, you know, concept of like, oh, different games do different things and they do different things well and they do different things poorly. I mean, look, you're trading off something no matter where you go. Shadow of the Weird Wizard is coming. Consider me interested. I will take the take a look at that. I'm I am I am interested. I don't know what that is. I know we have a lot of people in Northern Reaches who've only played fifth edition and PF2 yet play the game a lot. Um yeah. And, you know, Strat, that's okay. I'm not going to hate on somebody for liking the game that they like. But if you're in Nor if you're, if you're, if you're a part of our Patreon, chances are good that you are going to be exposed to more games and more opportunities to play those games, ask questions about those games, talk about those games, than pretty much 99% of role-playing gamers out there. So if you come to the Knights of Last Call and you somehow have zero interest and don't ever pick up anything else like then, you know, I don't know what to tell you like that. That was your golden opportunity, but far be it for me to tell people how they want to spend their free time and how they want to, you know, branch out. Like I said, someone goes, I only like cheese pizza. Well, maybe try some Chinese food or some Thai food or some Indian food. No, I only like cheese pizza. Like I'm not going to tell this person that they can't eat what they love and that they have to try different foods because they'll maybe they'll find something they love you know I, I i gotta get off my high horse on that one do i think that they should yes yes i do think that they should do i think they're silly for not yes i think they're silly but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna judge someone too harshly for that um a samurai faced each day expecting to die this game seems to embody this yeah i mean a, a quote or a refrain which is echoed often in the game is um, uh, a samurai lives at all times three feet from death. Three feet being the length of a katana, um, about a yard. Uh, because the idea is, is that a samurai, whether they are on a battlefield or in a, uh, you know, a, a throne room, is essentially always this close to saying something or having something happen, which will ultimately cost them their lives. And so, yeah, I mean, how a samurai deals and deals with death is essentially there. It consumes their whole existence um, because uh, a samurai essentially uh, should have no fear of death. And so they should act and respond to their duty as if death was not an issue. So, yeah, I mean, in a sense, uh, they do expect to die. Um. Yeah, your friends will not like what you like, and that's okay. Also, Strat, I think that's a great point, too. You know, there's so much that is in Northern Reaches that is inspired and taken from other game systems. Whether the players there or not realize it, they are being influenced by these games regardless. And if they really like Northern Reaches, and then they go play in a traditional Pathfinder game or Pathfinder Society game and suddenly go, this isn't as good as what I was doing in the Northern Reaches, well... Why? And then, you know, maybe they ask a question or they start doing some introspection and they realize, oh, it's because of all these other mechanics which they brought into it. By the way, for people who are watching, I have no idea what we're talking about. Northern Reaches is Night to Last Call, ongoing Pathfinder 2, massively multiplayer online TT, well, VTT RPG. So it's like World of Warcraft meets West Marches meets big old campaign. Many GMs, even more players, all playing in a persistent world throughout the week 
and your your character's actions all affect each other. Like if there's a dragon and it's killed, it's killed for everybody. It's not like a it doesn't respawn. You only get three lives. It's it's like a mix between a traditional campaign and an MMO, but using Pathfinder Two as the baseline. So uh, if you're interested in it, check it out. patreoncom slash call. Uh, join our Patreon. You can ask questions about it. We'll fill you in. It's pretty awesome. Um, actually, you only have 13 more days to sign up for this season. And then season one is locked to the end of the year until next year when we open up season two and we kind of restart the process again. So, uh, Okay. Oh, well, okay. John, I figured that's what it was, John. I mean, when you said that, I, I figured it was some sort of... Uh, derivative of shadow of the demon lord there's nothing more terrifying than being than being a low social samurai in the middle of the emperor's court yeah um yeah and and you know one of the things i love about legend of the five rings is how things like your honor and your glory and your um status uh not only matter from a role-playing perspective and from a world simulation perspective but also matter from a situation of mechanics um you know just saying something in a room, if your status is too low, could potentially be seen as being dishonorable because you're being rude and you shouldn't be speaking. And you know, you might you might suffer honor loss and glory loss just because you spoke. <laughs> uh, it's pretty pretty crazy. Um, uh, I had my first Northern Reaches game, and even that time spent mate made me rethink smaller things when I GM. Being outside your usual play group is exciting. Well, I mean, that's also another point, Ragon. A lot of people are in a pretty dense echo chamber and they've only ever played with the same group. That would be me. You know, I if I hadn't gotten to go to so many Gen Cons and Origins and uh, other gaming conventions over the many, you know, past 20 years, I think I probably would pretty much have played with the same eight to 10 people for most of my adult life. Uh, and you know, you get very limited viewpoints from that perspective. I had the blessings to be able to go to things like Gen Con and for whatever reason, had the inclination to try different role-playing games and experience different types and ways of playing and going to different seminars. And that exposed me in a way that a lot of people don't get. So YouTube for me is sort of me trying to do that for other people. Um, to me, it fills that niche of playing something like a guy axes. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Strat. That's a huge inspiration for the way that Northern Reaches is. So, um, which you never thought you'd get to do. Yeah. Um, in fact, I mean, I don't. Well, we can talk about this later, Strat. But originally, Northern Reaches has changed very differently from the way that I originally expected it to be. My original idea was that GMs would create their dungeon. At kind of in the way the old Gygaxian way like the the lost tombs of Triune and it's like I this GM I have one dungeon I it's like three or four pages of graph paper it has 80 rooms 60 rooms it has dozens and dozens of encounters and groups keep going back to it and you know they get deeper and deeper because the things that they killed are still dead but then if people leave the dungeon alone for a few weeks maybe some new monsters come up or i decide oh the the, the trolls that are on level three go up to level two and start you know spreading their lair and now they've taken over level three or two i expected people to sort of be associate a dungeon with a gm and for gms to use this as a way to develop their dungeon building skills but that did not happen so that seems acceptable, Mr. Van Tonder. That seems acceptable. <laughs> uh, so if we're putting a bow on L5R, then what systems are we going to discuss next? More root, or are you going to keep it a secret? Um, well, root would help because we're going to play it eventually. Uh, we've seen some people ask about 2D20 systems. I think there's still a lot of questions about Blaze in the Dark. Um, I think we could talk about a lot of things. I mean, maybe we'll just make it a Patreon poll. And we'll let people, uh, you know, people who pay the bills get to decide what we talk about next. But, you know, um, I think these are a lot of fun. Again, not very good for the views on YouTube, but, uh, you know, I think they're important. And I'm glad. And, and the reason, let me be clear before I sign off, the reason that I can make these videos, these live streams, is because of the Knights of Last Call patrons. Because I do not rely on YouTube advertising views for 
the money that this channel needs to stay afloat, to stay solvent, to pay for our subscriptions to things and to pay for our cameras and our lights and our videos and all this sort of stuff. My YouTube is like, it's like a drop in the bucket. 95% of the income from this channel comes from our patrons. So this is 100% a Patreon sponsored channel. And because of that, and because of what they are interested in, uh, I am able to make ch views like this, or videos like this, and not care that it's only gonna get 600 views and that YouTube is not gonna show it to anybody. Because for the people who are interested and do wanna see this, they will find it, they will get to sit down, they will get to watch this. And um, you know, I'm really, really thankful and appreciative to our patrons for not only being so generous with their money, obviously, that's a huge deal, but also for being so interesting and being so interested in these different games and in these different systems and being willing to put a little money each month into you know our coffers so that we can try in our own way uh, with your help to figure out a way to, to bring something, create something special or magical on the internet that allows us to share and grow and develop this role-playing game community in our own way. Because I don't remember who said the quote, but it's like, be the, uh, be the change you want to see in the world. I don't remember. It's famous. I should know it, but I don't. Um, and so I, you know, I want role-playing games as a hobby to thrive and grow. I am disappointed in some ways with the current state of role-playing. And, uh, you know, I don't think D&D &D did it the best. But Stratega tip seven dollars. <laughs> hey, stream appreciation tip. Thank you, sir. You also took somebody out, and uh, now you're the hype boss. So nice, nice little snipe there too. But yeah, I want to be the change I want to see in the world. Um, I want to make these videos. You all are helping me make them, uh, so that we can get this information out here. Try to grow an ever growing community. Um, you know, as you know, a, a Pathfinder Two channel. I'd like to not only support a game which is you know not number one, but also I think has a lot of promise and prem you know a lot of uh, strength and advantage to it but also i like showing people why pathfinder 2 isn't the best and why pathfinder 2 could use improvements and things that could change and ways that you could change it to make the game better um and so those are some of the things that i want to focus on in our battle cry magazine in our video series and our live streams etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean people are upset that i had, did a clear class tier ranking and i didn't think everything was s tier and a tier Sorry, you know, I just think mechanically some of the classes, not as good as the other ones. Um, so yeah, uh, I want to say thank you to everybody who came out tonight, everybody who tipped and supported. Uh, there was definitely a bunch of you, and I really appreciate that, especially here on a Sunday night. Thank you for staying up late with me. Uh, we'll see you, if you're a Patreon member, we'll see you tomorrow, Monday, 8 p.m. We're doing a little bit later because Bob has a meeting, but we're going to have our Patreon exclusive Q&A. And then we'll leave back this week, Tuesday and Monday, or Tuesday and Thursday, to really go into detail about all these, uh, you know, crazy things and amazing things. And, um, hey, <laughs> I removed Strat from the scene. Wow. You know what? Uh, that's a fantastic snipe, buddy. I appreciate the money. Short rain, Strat. Short rain. Um, I appreciate that you did the math to calculate it. I really appreciate that, but I got to tip my hat to Ragon for coming in here with the $50 super chat just to wipe you out. And I, uh, I definitely appreciate both of you, but I do have to appreciate the, the skill and the humor of Ragon to just take you out like that deliberately with a snipe. Uh, yes, you have removed Strat from the scene. The conflict scene is over. Now we will go to downtime, uh, where I'm going to, uh, do a montage of me getting ready for the week. And, uh, and then uh, tomorrow we'll be back into narrative mode back on our Patreon Discord where all the magic happens. Um, thanks, Ben. I appreciate it. Glad you hung out with us tonight. Thanks for everybody who stuck around. There's about 20 or 25 of you. So, uh, And if you're watching on the video on demand and you have questions about Legend of the Five Rings, leave a comment below or hop over to our Patreon Discord. Sign up for three or five or 10 bucks, 25 if you're feeling real saucy. Um, and get into it. Ask us questions. Um, talk about the game. Uh, you know, we're, we're not just one RPG. We are a variety of RPGs, you know, and uh, that's what makes us, I think, unique and different. Uh, you're going to end up buying a lot of new RPGs if you come to Night's Last Call or playing a lot of role-playing games or both. So either way, I think it's going to be pretty good. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you again for hanging out uh, with us tonight. Uh, thank you for the great questions. And again, thank you to my patrons who support and make this channel 
happen. Uh, they, you know, we, we're going to talk about this tomorrow, but we had a really great month, a lot of growth, a lot of upgrades, um, some really great tipping. Uh, we just had a really great month. You know, it was my birthday month and everybody pulled through. We had a really great month and that's going to really, really allow us to do some cool things uh, with our channel that we otherwise wouldn't get to do if it weren't for you all. So thanks again. And we'll see you next week on nights of last call.